We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andrew and I'm here with... Rob H., this is A.V. Rant. It's your home theater and A.V. questions answered. We're rapidly approaching Christmas. There will be no Christmas show that, that week because Christmas Eve is Monday and Christmas Day is Tuesday, so we're, we're not recording that week. But uh, I'm, I actually haven't even told Tom this. I'm trying to maybe do a guest appearance with Lee to do the whole like converting things to videotape that he's wanted to do for ages and ages. So I'm like... what? Yeah. He wants to convert things to videotape? Or from videotape to digital. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. Okay, okay. Misspoke yeah, yeah. there. But yeah, uh, since I have a little bit of time this week, he and I might record that. We've penciled it in. Why so. don't you just record it the week before Christmas so I could take because that Because Because now, now is the time when I could actually record it with him. I think you just fill in for me. You guys could talk. It'll be fine. Well, not on Christmas week. That doesn't help anything. So No, the week before, I said. The week before... Well, I don't have any time the week before. We're gonna what time? Are we, so we're not recording the week before Christmas either. No, that's next week. Next week we're recording, but I don't have time to do two. That's what I'm saying. Do it instead of me. But then we wouldn't have a show in the can for Christmas week, which oh, is the whole okay. point of doing a second show this week. Okay, you see how that okay, goes? Okay. I don't. Really you need care. to multiply we... <laughs> by two to go across. People two weeks. are going to be listening on Christmas week. They're going to be so busy being disappointed by what their family got them. I could be. Friday. You never know. It's Friday after Christmas. People are probably still off work. And they're going to want to listen to something. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe they're two hours, well, they're, while they're waiting in line for two hours to return their crappy gifts. Yeah. Now that I've said that, probably will all fall through and there won't be a show that week. But whatever. <laughs> you never know. I, uh, I asked for one up. thing for Christmas. I know. Uh-huh. One thing. I want a garlic press. <laughs> okay. That I, should be doable. I, I have bought every garlic press <laughs> at every store in the in, in the area. All ah. the Targets, all the Walmarts, all that stuff. And then I have hated them all. And I finally got so mad at the last one that I threw it away. Like in the middle of using it. I was like, I hate you. Throw it away. <laughs> Going to have to go <laughs> to a proper kitchen supply I store. I don't know. I'm so particular about my kitchen. I'm like mm. as particular about my kitchen stuff as I am about my AV gear. So No wonder you like and, Bob's Burgers. I haven't finished. I stopped watching that a long time ago. Really? But I, I still, yeah, good. I like it. It's yeah. good. Yeah, I like just stopped. I guess <laughs> there was a TV show I wanted to talk about. I can't remember what it is. Oh, I watched uh, the new Blade Runner movie finally oh. last night. Two and a two hours and forty three minutes. Jeez. Oh, the twenty forty nine. Ah. Oh, it, for Ryan reason, Gosling I, was I, a perfect I, choice for that. He already acts like a robot. It's like, for some like, reason, I pictured Blade in my head, and I was like, "There's a oh. new Blade movie," and I was like, "Wait, he said Blade Runner. That's that's yeah, significantly yeah. different. That's not vampires." Yeah. All right, no, not vampire. All right, this is AV Rant the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. Get your questions answered. All you have to do is ask. Ask by emailing us a question at avrant.com. The www.avrant.com. Uh, leave us a comment there if you can. If you can't, let yeah. us know. So I know. <laughs> Better yet, just go to Facebook.com and uh, slash AV Rant. Podcast. And podcast. I can't remember. Facebook.com slash AV Rant Podcast. That's, that's and, uh, on Facebook. Hit us up, uh, hit us up there. We respond very quickly. Though question at AV Rant is still the best way. Question at AV Rant.com. Email is the best. Email is the best. Uh, YouTube.com slash AV Rant. And if you want to uh, contact Rob directly, it's Rob at AV Rant.com. His Twitter is at First Reflect. Are you still posting about so you think you can dance? Not so much. I mean, the season's been over for since the summer, so no, uh, no, not, is it not done? Much to say about Did they it. kill that show yet? Is it uh, dead? Haven't heard if it's coming back for a fifteenth season if it gets renewed again. Oh so I don't know. These Possibly. things are so cheap to produce <laughs> that they're like uh, like oh we only got uh, fifteen. Well, I don't know like, if it because ah, it's the it. music rights, which is the reason it's never come out on disc. You can never purchase that show because they can never secure the music rights. It's too, oh, right. too expensive. Mm. Yeah. All right, so his Twitter is at First Reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. I, the reason I asked about that is because many people f- flock to Rob to ask ask questions and then quickly flee from Rob once. Yeah. So you think you can dance starts because he starts posting about it nonstop, <laughs> like some sort of weirdo. All I want to talk about right now is she, Rob, but I'm I'm holding off. <laughs> I have not. Is that what? what what's your, is that Netflix? It's Netflix. Yeah. 
And honestly, if, if, you, if you're watching through the first seven episodes, you're going to be like, really? But it's like episode eight onwards. That's when it gets really good. So like I say, you, you can basically do one, six, eight, and then go. And that's not too much. <laughs> All right. I just finished My Hero Academia. If you're into anime, that's a good one. That's pretty decent. Uh, the three seasons that we I have available to me. Uh, but I guess I just want to like contrast the clearly child focused one with yes. the more adult focused one. Yes. All right. Uh, let's get to our listeners of the week. Become a listener of the week. You support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to www.avrant.com and clicking the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link mm -hmm. and give us in the PayPal donations. We want to thank Robert G for doing that this week. Those monies will go into our coffers to help pay for our hosting fees and other things. So thank you, Robert. Yeah, Robert, thank you so much for uh, supporting us financially over at PayPal. And uh, that, that's great. I think he actually goes by Bob G. I think I'm thinking I'm recalling that correctly from emails. Ah, oh, whatever. Okay, well, I'm sorry, Robert, Bob, whatever. Sorry. We also want to thank our, our 76 patrons over at Patreon.com. Patreon is a service where you sign up and to support your content creators uh, monthly. So they will take a monthly pull from your account and give some of it to us. So uh, minimum is a dollar and the mix maximum is infinity. So we're still waiting for that infinity. Definitely. Bill Gates, you're out there. <laughs> Well, we appreciate our 76 patrons over at patreon.com slash Can you imagine podcast. if Bill Gates listened to this podcast? God, why not? Why the heck not? Oh, He's man. He's retired like, at this point, isn't he? What do you mean that the audio is screwed up on the Xbox? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm we sure can get that some is stuff done Bill around Gates here. Bill Gates' top priority. I'm certain he sits awake at night thinking about Xbox One audio issues. Well, I'm saying he would listen to podcasts as the first thing you would hear. We talk about that every week. <laughs> uh, I also want to thank uh, our other listeners of the week. These people support the podcast in other non-financial ways. I want to thank uh, Jason Gregg, who's in talks with me about sending his po his uh, PS3 to my parents to have hold in reserve for when my autistic brother's PS3 uh, breaks down. And I have to say, I just got an email from... <laughs> you and your emails. Why is the podcast when it's time to check emails? Thanks Greg. to Jason, by the way. Greg. So there's Jason Greg, Jason Greg. and there's just okay, Greg. there's Greg somebody else, uh -huh. right, who has uh, also offered to send me a PS3. Oh, there so you I go. So I could have like a stack of them. And believe, believe it or not, I mean, it, it sounds it like... It get used, yeah. It would, it, this is 100%. I mean, if you're not going to use your PS3, send them to me. My parents will <laughs> thank you forever. Yeah. Because my brother is... Just getting him to transition from the PS2 to the PS3 mm, was like mm, a year mm. of of torture. So, um, yes, I will take all of your PS3s that you are not using, I... and we will just stack them at my parents' house. In fact, I my PS3 is probably going to end up there someday, too. Tom's so. going to end up battling Samaritan. That, that's there a you go. person of interest thing. Yes, I, re I remember. I remember they had all the PS3s lined All up the PS3s. Sure. Yes. <laughs> We also want to thank Boshko, who asked us a while back if we thought that uh, SVS NSD series subwoofers would come back this year for another Black Friday sale. We said we didn't know, kind of doubted that there was any more stock, but of course, happily, they did come back. Mm -hmm. He bought two PB12 NSDs and told SVS it was entirely because of AV Rant. There you go. So thank you. Reason. That does help us out. Maybe he doesn't yeah. even need them. <laughs> Just like James from last week. Uh, well, all right. In the Boshko. news. Uh, Carl, Arkham has uh, joined the IMAX Enhanced Program. Their AVR 390, 550, and 850 receivers. Why the 390? Why isn't it the 350? I don't know. They're all other 50s. Maybe that one's actually newer, for all we know. I don't know. Stupid. <laughs> Along with their... Eight, I'm sorry. Here we go. 850. Oh, this is an 860 pre-pro. Yes. So the 860. That kind of makes sense. Okay, it's a pre-pro. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all support IMAX Enhanced now. All four of these models can process 7.1.4 signals and include direct live. Suggested prices go from 2500 up to six grand. Yuppers. They do have a slightly odd thing. So, I mean, they have a full set of 7.1.4 pre-outs, so that's always fine. You could use yeah. any of these as a, as a full-on pre-pro. so on the pre-pro. <laughs> but uh, on the AV receiver models, for whatever reason, RCAM doesn't let you like assign the amplifiers the the built-in because they have seven built-in amplifiers not yeah. nine or eleven so you might be thinking oh okay i'll power my front three right and then right. 
uh, or yeah, my front three and my surrounds or something externally, and then let the internal amps power my surround backs and four overheads or something. Nope, can't reassign it that way. It's like the seven amps that are built in are locked to the front three surrounds and surround backs. If you're going to do the four overheads, those must be powered externally, and that's so. If you want to power the front three, you have to you and you want the full seven point one point four. You have to get a five a seven, seven, seven power a seven channel yeah, amplifier because you'd have to do four overheads and yeah. the front three. Yeah. So, and then you would have three wasted amplifiers in your Arkham. Kind of. That, that's, that's... It's just something to be aware of. Well thought out. But uh, uh, We've also yeah. often recommended LG OLED TVs, and we've praised their active HDR dynamic tone mapping that ignores HDR metadata and just analyzes the image frame by frame inside the TV itself. Mm -hmm. The fact that I can say that entire sentence... And have it kind of make sense? With one breath. <laughs> Having read it for the exact first time just mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Any voiceover work you guys got out there? Just let me know. <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> but the 2018 models that used the Alpha 9 processor, uh, so the C8 on up, had an odd issue where there was a visible lag when the scene quickly cut from an overall dim image to an overall bright image, or vice versa, making it look as though the whole light level was pumping up and down. Mm -hmm. Another full sentence. LG said they were working on a fix, and thankfully new firmware arrived relatively quickly and fixes the issue. So that's good. So it, they, they, it was broken and they fixed it. Yeah, yeah so I don't, news. we don't always talk about every firmware update, but this was kind of a significant one, especially since we've been recommending C8 OLEDs recently, and if this right. was the issue where people are like, ah, I'm not sure because I've heard about this light pumping issue, it's like, ah, they fixed it, so okay. carry on. Okay, Oppo announced. Oops, I hit the camera. Oppo announced that they're now an HDR10 Plus licensee. Wait, they don't make stuff anymore. <laughs> I know. <laughs> they, they don't. They stop making. So they're working on adding HDR10 Plus support to their Ultra HD Blu-ray players via firmware update. Too bad you can't buy their Ultra <laughs> HD Blu-ray players anymore. But it'll. If you could get one, it will. You could upgrade it to HDR10 Plus. Well, I'm sure they made the announcement. That's so strange. Pe people have been continuing to to uh, you know bother the Oppo reps. They're like, "When are we getting HDR10 Plus? There's there's two whole discs that use it now. How can you Oppo who doesn't even make players anymore not support it?" So they're like, "All right, I guess we'll try to support it." <laughs> All right, they, Tom they Cruise and and Chris McQuarrie took a break during filming Top Gun Maverick. Really. Yep, Top Gun Maverick. That is the name. It's Top Gun Maverick. To make a PSA about turning off video interpolation, aka motion smoothing. Yeah, I heard about this. That's what they like. called it. It made the rounds. It must be commented on. It, I mean, you know what? I'm completely in agreement with the message. I just, there's no way to not feel a little bit strange about watching them, at least for me. Because it's like, this is a, a strange way to deliver this information. Yeah. But hey, you know what? If it reaches people who n it would never would have reached otherwise, then All the people not? who don't listen to this podcast, yeah. <laughs> I'm all for it. I mean, it's a, what is it, like a minute and a half long, so it's not going to not gonna eat up your day. But it's just, it's just like, it's Tom Cruise, Chris McQuarrie standing beside it. They're like, I'd like to take a moment of your day to tell you about motion smoothing <laughs> it's like I'm not, I'm not sure i ever expected to see it delivered quite in that style but there this you go. is your brain yeah this is your brain on motion interpolation yeah pretty much <laughs> man uh, that commercial 100 percent did not have the that psa the brain on drugs one <laughs> did not work 100 <laughs> percent. i remember when that one came out and i was like uh, let's say I was in the room with people who were uh, who maybe the message was intended for, I and gotcha. when they saw him crack that egg with one hand, they were like, "That is the awesomest dude!" <laughs> oh, jeez, this is what they took away from it. Yes, that's what they took away. They're like, "That guy is so cool, man! I could watch this <laughs> over and over again." Um, All right, Infinite Gary heard our under five hundred dollar tur turntable recommendations and wanted to suggest his favorite, which is a Music Hall MMF one point five that goes for four hundred bucks. So there's another one. Yes, and uh, it is shockingly similar to the uh, Fluence that was already mentioned, <laughs> including uh, using the same Audio-Technica cartridge and needle, uh, looking almost identical, although I will say the Music Hall does have the ability to play uh, 75s, right? The other one can play 45s and 33s, but uh, the Music Hall does give you the dial setting to uh, play 75s, but they look shockingly similar and are mm. priced extremely similar, and they're both belt-driven, but appear to be 
Audio Technicas. Otherwise, I also found it amusing that Music Hall sells a model called the USB-1, which if you do take a gander at that image, even though the base of it is black instead of silver, if you look at the Audio Technica LP-120 USB, man, do those look similar. <laughs> but again, the Audio Technica, is, the Audio Technica <laughs> is direct drive for the platter, while the Music Hall is a belt-driven alternate because there is no question that that began its life as the audio tactic they look nearly identical <laughs> there's nothing i mean if you, you may hear us say this and say oh well you know you think well, you know this is somehow a bad thing it's not really you know this, this is very very commonly done like if you buy an integra you're buying an onkyo i mean if you buy yeah, a, well, of uh, course, yeah. you know you know, the Morants and the Dendents have a lot of similarities, but you know they are there are changes that are made. Sure. So clearly, the the drive system is different. Oh yeah, I mean that's, yeah, that's an obvious change there. So. But who knows what other changes they made as well? Could be. So could be. you know, you don't don't just say that we're discounting this. We don't care. I mean, OEMing is something that's done. Well, actually, going back to the, the Oppo thing, I believe Cambridge is still selling their alternate version of the Oppo. Yeah. So that, that's like still a way to kind of get an Oppo right now. Right. But how much is it? It's a lot more. I think it's like 800 bucks. Yeah. All right. Let's get into the questions. The Ping Pong Theater Ed has something to ask. He's a while back. Ed wrote us about his two channel setup. He has a pair of Boston acoustic speakers and several different two channel amps, a mono t mono price tube amp, uh, SMSL DAC amp combo thingy, and an Onkyo and the vintage, uh, an old Onkyo and a vintage Nyko 5010. I don't know what that is, but I guess it's an amp. He wanted to be able to select which amplifier was powering the speakers without having to physically plug and unplug the speaker wires every time. So we suggest just trying the monoprice speaker selector that has one input and four outputs, but wiring things in reverse so that one pair of speakers is connected to the input and the four different amplifiers connected to the outputs. We suggested that? I mentioned that it might be a way to have things physically connected, but I... Almost certain, I can't say with 100% certainty that I said, but I'm almost certain that I warned that you really want to make sure all the amplifiers are completely powered off because these things are all internally connected. I'm pretty darn I mean, sure I gave that warning, but yeah, I, I'm that, not going to swear my life on it, but I'm okay. pretty sure I did. Yeah, I have, since, you know, back when I was working for Audioholics, the, you know, testing amplifiers, multiple mm -hmm. amplifiers with one set of speakers is it's, always a challenge it's because a challenge, yeah. they can, even with their powered off, right. it's, it can be yeah. problematic. Yeah. You, you need a, a physical like piece of metal moving between things, things so that yeah. one is completely disconnected and the other one is now connected. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I've even, I've even asked like, okay, well, cause I was working with Gene, I'm like, what if I take, you know, two receivers, plug them, you know, they have two sets of binding posts, but they're, you know, you keep the, the, the little bridge intact and mm. you plug, you know, the top one into one amplifier, the bottom one into another amplifier, and then you physically turn off the two things. He's like, no, nah, man, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, you don't want to do that. I'm like, okay. I mean, what if I unplugged him? He goes, no. Like, okay. And I'll, he's an electrical engineer, I'm not. Yes. All right. So we're going back to uh, Ping Pong Ed here, uh, but that hasn't really worked. If more than one amplifier is plugged into the wall outlet, sometimes it's a protection circuit and one of the other amps will trip. If he has two different sources playing through two different amps and he's trying to switch back and forth on the fly, there will be sound leakage, even if he deselects all four channels on the speaker selector. So it would appear that the four outputs are always connected to each other with no way to fully turn off three channels while only leaving one channel active. That has him, has him worried about potentially damaging his amps and his speakers. I would be worried about it as yep, well. Yep. So it's basically left him back with plugging, uh, physically plugging and unplugging. So we asked, now that we've had all this time to think about it, since we have clearly thought about it a lot since then, <laughs> is there a better device, a better solution? The speaker selector uh, has a button on the front labeled a single pair direct, but the manual mentions that it controls the impedance protection circuit. So would having that either press on or off make a difference in this, with this reverse setup of multiple amps all feeding one pair of speakers? You need a, you need the amp selector switch is what you need, and I don't even know if that's made. Yeah. Is that made? Ah. Uh... I mean, there's like professional ones that are right, you know, right, right, in, right, right, into the right, thousands right. of dollars, but that right, right, that right. wasn't what he was looking for. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, the, so I don't know. Banana I'm, plugs are your friend, I guess, is you know, is right. the, what I would say. But I mean, literally, banana plugs are your friend because you can just, you know, pretty quickly. But that's, I, honestly, I don't really think that you should be doing this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's the... This is, uh, is it any better? Monoprice has a very different speaker selector switch, which is an AB 
speaker selector switch, meaning A, B for two sources, then feeding up to four different pairs of speakers. Um, but all four of those speaker outputs are still like semi-connected to each other because they can all share one of those sources or like you could have right. two of the speakers uh, or speaker pairs sharing source A and two of the speaker pairs sharing source B, but they do have a source A and a source B. So I'm, I'm wondering with that one, if you said, okay, three of the amplifiers, which are powered off, are feeding... Okay, so it's still going in reverse, right? So three of the amplifiers, which are actually connected to the speaker outputs but you say those are feeding source B and then the only one that's active is feeding source A, maybe that would work because the source A and the source B switch on this one, those do truly change between, right? Like if you choose source A for one of the speaker outputs, it's not like it's going to leak through source B. I, um, I think this is another rabbit hole that is not going to work out. I mean, none of these are meant for... Well, it no, isn't think... meant for amplifier because there's a speaker wire input from two different source outputs, then feeding four different pairs of speakers. That's the way it's intended to be used. Right. And again, where I'm potentially thinking you wire that in reverse, you'd have to be very careful and make sure that three of them are always going to source I... B while only one of them goes to source A. But I don't, I mean, it's 60 I bucks. Think it's... it's not crazy I... expensive. I'll be honest with you. The, 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 the solution to this quote unquote problem is to uh, either do enough research yourself to figure out how to build one that's a physical mm. switch or right. to like call your local college you know, junior college high you know regular college high school you know that has an I mean this is like program. we're actually talking about a mechanical switch would be it's what you want because we it's want like... a piece of metal that moves between different contacts so it is completely out of contact with everything other than the one and amplifier you know, that you want to connect. yes and there's it's grounded from everything else there's yeah. no there's no leakage there's no anything yeah so i mean the, that should exist shouldn't it <laughs> it should but nobody it's like this it's like oh you should be able to build this you know this this one specific thing for this one specific yeah. use case which is what he's talking about and everybody else is like why would i build that no one's gonna buy it. well it's kind of like something i've been wondering that i've never been able to be fine which is like let's say you have a super audio cd player one of the older ones that only has 5.1 analog outputs right and you want to connect it to a receiver that doesn't have 5.1 analog inputs so you want an hdmi input and it's like there's sh it shouldn't be that complicated to take a 5.1 analog signal convert that into 5.1 pcm and then send that through an hdmi connection that's not that complicated a signal process but, but the prop nobody makes yeah. such a device <laughs> no it makes such a device because the device itself would be expensive enough that if you wanted it right. you would just buy the receiver that could do it anyways kind yeah yeah I guess so, so this is this is what i'm saying yeah. is that y you can describe what you want and i think that what you need to do is just you know as Go talk to somebody mm. who's an electrical engineer and say, can you build this for yeah. me and how much would it cost? Because all these other things that you're doing, you're going to damage your equipment, man. Right. You're, you're yeah, going to I mean, break he, something. He's not talking about distributing the amplifier no. to multiple speakers, or, which is exactly no. what these devices are meant to do, is distribute one amplifier to multiple pairs of speakers. I mean, he's talking about a very simple thing, which is I want one amp at a time, but all of them easily switch between one pair of speakers. That is a mechanical switch that you're looking for. Yeah. Right. He says in another setup, he has an ELAC Unify speakers connected to his home theater receiver. He'd like to be able to feed the ELAC speakers from a different amplifier sometimes. Is there any way to do that? Now that one, it seems like the AB switch is exactly for that, right? <laughs> I mean, Monoprice has a, a two in, four out, and they have a two in, two out, but it's AB selector. So it's two sources which right. is what he has. He has the speaker wire outputs from his receiver and the speaker wire outputs from a second amplifier. I have to look at this device that you're recommending here so I can see yeah. what you're talking about. And then uh, he just wants to switch which source is feeding, in his case, his one pair of speakers, but that's fine. You say that one pair of speakers is now connected to source A or that one pair of speakers is connected to source B. That, that, the monoprice AB selector switch should be exactly for that purpose. So if you just have the two sources, then the two in, two out would work. Uh, or I, um, 
yeah, that's all you need because he's only talking about one pair of speakers in either case. So that's that's only 40 bucks. Uh, the other one is two sources and up to four speaker pairs. Yeah. That one should work for that purpose. <laughs> I'm just looking at it. Yep, 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 yep. I mean, it's it's meant exactly for that. Two different sources. Potentially feeding two or four different pairs of speakers. I think so. I think that's good. I, I'd have to look at that, but I'll take your word for it. Yeah. All right. Because it looks to me like it's meant to be connected to two different pairs of speakers, but okay. Let's go to DJ on Twitter. DJ is using an Oppo 203 to play an Ultra HD Blu-rays on a 1080p projector because he wants the Atmos or DTX audio that's often found only on the 4K disc. You and me both, DJ. Yeah, it works Tom's in the just, same boat. It works just fine, he says. But he was wondering if converting the 4K HDR and wide color down to his 1080p displays any sort of advantage or maybe even a disadvantage. Any thoughts? Well, the thoughts are that sometimes it looks weird. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'm yeah. Tom can tell you firsthand because he's doing yeah. exactly that scenario. I'm doing exactly that. Like uh, at the very beginning of Infinity War, which is because I have watched the first half to third of that movie about 17 <laughs> times and I fall asleep because I usually start at 11 p.m. on a Friday night after everybody goes home. Well done. And, um, yeah. Uh, Loki's hair looks weird. Okay. Uh, the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park with, with mm. the 4K mm. remix look super fake. <laughs> like, they look so real in the DVD and the Blu-ray, but they look super fake mm. in the in the 4K. So, um, yeah, that's the disadvantage. Uh, but... The, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about is how some of these players have the ability to, you know, uh, change how it right. handles HDR and stuff. And that will hopefully become more ubiquitous going forward. And I'll get a new Blu-ray, you know, Ultra HD Blu-ray player and then use that. Right. Yeah. The, in my experience, the toughest part seems to have been the conversion of the uh, Rec 2020 wide color down to yeah. the Rec 709 8-bit color that seems to be the trickiest part because i'm uh, converting the 4k resolution down to 1080p that's really no problem that's not um and on the oppo converting the hdr to sdr that's done really well and you can adjust it yourself if you're like this looks a little too bright a little too dim overall or whatever you can adjust that manually so the hdr to sdr conversion hasn't been the big problem with a player like that but the the conversion of the color, there there are... I mean, it's not like it's all the time you're looking at it going, oh, that color looks way off. It's not that type of thing. No, it's, it's usually just in the darks for occasionally me. Occasionally, it doesn't look quite right, and the Blu-ray actually looks better if you're just playing it on a 1080p display. Yeah. So, yeah, it's hard to say that I would call it an advantage to play the 4K version on a 1080p display. Well, I, I don't think I could. Yeah, the advantage is that you get the audio. The audio, that's exactly. The, that's the, ev the advantage. And, and, it's, and it's not that sometimes so bad that unless you're a real stickler, I would avoid it on the video side. It's, it's just like a couple of scenes A couple here of scenes there. here or there. Yeah. yeah. Monty. As an unfortunate reminder, Monty lost his home in California in the California wildfires and will eventually need to replace all of his belongings after dealing with insurance and finding a new place to live. In the meantime, he's doing a bit of daydreaming about uh, the new home theater gear he will purchase, and he appreciates our previous suggestions and letting him uh, get a little bit excited by thinking of his, this whole ordeal as an opportunity to start his theater from scratch and maybe even end up with an upgrade or two. Mm -hmm. But for the immediate future, he and his family will be renting. He knows there's no point in trying to get a whole theater set up right now when he doesn't know what his future theater room will look like. But it's he's still going to have a TV yes. while they're renting, so he has an idea in mind. In his old place, he had a 2.1 set up in his master bedroom using another pair of M&K speakers and with an M&K sub, all powered by a Yamaha receiver that was actually sent to him by Tom a long time ago. Now, when I read this, I was like, I sent somebody a receiver? <laughs> okay. He said so. Okay, a long time ago when Tom was cleaning out some old gear, and I was like, nope. Monty says he had the funky remote that he was, try and it was trying to be a, a sort of an activity-based setup long before Harmony was even around, if that rings any bells. Yes! <laughs> I was looking for that receiver! <laughs> it's a good thing he said that. I was like, like two years ago, I was like trying to <laughs> put a receiver in my parents' house. I'm like, where the heck did that thing uh... go? <laughs> Well, now you know. Now I know Monty had it. It's he, burned up in he California. Had it. It's gone. Yeah, you ain't getting that receiver back, Tom. I, I wouldn't didn't want it back. Uh, but I just was, it was funny that I couldn't find it. Because um, I was looking for it. I was. Uh, that's hilarious. I That little receiver was kind of cute. And that wasn't before Harmony was out. Oh, okay. Let's just, yeah, that's not 
the case. It was before Harmony came out with like the the hub super system cool, and everything. The hub system, the super okay. cool interface. All right. Uh, okay. So he uh, he ha- also had the Panasonic Plasma TV in that master bedroom setup. So Monty was thinking that they could maybe replace that 2.1 setup quite soon, and so while they're in rental and rather than in the rental place and it would be their main setup for watching tv and whatnot right now then it could go in this master bedroom again once this house has been rebuilt in like a few years does this sound like a reasonable idea i think it sounds super reasonable mm-hmm. uh you know i i actually really like this idea now i mean i don't know what your budget's going to be for a house or that sort of stuff or how much right. how much you can anticipate the size of your master bedroom to be although i so, mean if it's being rebuilt can't you kind of dictate <laughs> well i don't know that he's rebuilding i thought he was or i mean i don't maybe he's building buying, again or buying yeah or, yeah yeah because a lot of times they're not gonna they're just gonna give you the money and say you mm. can use it to rebuild or you can use but i mean it is he buy buying a, a palatial estate with a master bedroom that's the size of a great room I mean, if it's a normal family house how big is the master bedroom well really that's what i'm saying be? i mean if he can anticipate that yeah because what i'm worried about more than anything it's not is buying a big TV because you want a big TV I now see. and then getting it to your bedroom and going, Oh, too big. What the heck are we going to put this thing? Mm. So, but at the same time, you also don't want to, you know, end up in a, <laughs> with a 55 inch TV and your, your master bedroom's 30 feet long. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Oh, well, I mean, these days, thing. honestly, I mean, 65 TV isn't, isn't even that big, you know? It's like, yeah. Yeah. I, I can so, live with that just uh, about anywhere. That's about the only thing I would worry okay. about. I mean, the speakers, uh, the speakers in the set, and uh, getting a little yeah. Uh, sub- I mean, a good pair like of bookshelf speakers in just about any imaginable normal master bedroom is going to be completely fine, both right. then and now. So right, yeah. right, and then you can you can go with a small SVS sub, you yeah. know, sealed like one, a nice sealed a, sub, yeah, yeah, like a, a SB two thousand, SB one thousand, depending on your budget, yeah. and you know, I think that's a, I think it's a really good idea. Uh, I agree. Yeah. So he asks if it's just a 2.1 speaker setup, what products would we recommend? Mm. I would 100% recommend you go with the RBHs with the upgraded tweeters. The elites. The elites. The impression 100%. elite series. And yeah, then I would I'm... do an SB2000. That's like off the bat, I'd yep. be like, okay, SB2000, I know it's small, and I know it's going to fill up almost any bedroom I can yep. imagine. Yep. And the, and RBH would just be a nice way for you to get a nice pair of neutral speakers mm-hmm. that are, you know, High power handling, you know. If you that go with the can... glossy versions, they look really nice as well. Uh, and and it gets your ears kind of calibrated to really even sound. Well, plus we you know, know he liked M and K. So yeah. if you liked M and K, I cannot imagine a scenario where you wouldn't like the RBH impression elites. It, I mean, it you could do the listening tests, right? You could talk to Ascend. You could talk to SBS because yes. they have the return shipping and stuff like right. that. You could A B all three of those. Yeah, I would definitely order the RBHs though. Uh, one hundred. I mean, I would order them. I mean, I guess there's as a scenario one of the ones where that you would his... you would recommend. Yeah, I'm I mean, get... uh, yeah, uh, one of the ones that you would audition. Yeah, I'm gu- I'm guessing the the scenario could be that he actually has a lot more money to spend than we're thinking. So in that case, maybe like Ascend's Sierra Twos could be on the table. You know, sure. they're like fourteen hundred dollars a pair, so much more expensive. If that's the type of budget, I you know, by all means, bring those into audition. But my first thought is exactly like Tom's. I'm like, Impression Elites, RBH, man, that would be a great way to start. Yeah. Uh, and what to power them? What, what would you power a 2.1 setup with? Well, I mean, a lot of times people are going to say, well, you know, get an integrated amp. But you would really want, uh, you know, good bass management and everything yeah. else. So and you I still mean, want HDMI switching. This is a TV setup. Right. I mean, I imagine... I mean, it depends what TV goes with too. I mean, it's going to use all the amps that I mean, all the apps that are in the TV because mm. they do the stuff. And basically, and use the TV to do the switching as the source. Yeah, because you are be. only outputting a two-channel signal, so that you're not Which is worried every about every TV can do Atmos yeah. coming out of it or something. Yeah. If you're not going to plug in, uh, if you're not going to plug in a, uh, uh, a Ultra HD Blu-ray player or something like that in there, mm. if you're never going to watch movies, you're only going to stream. Maybe all you need is is a small receiver or you know a basic receiver and a source uh Could be. your tv i mean so uh yeah in any re- I, mean, I, I i of course like odyssey but i think in this situation it's not as important to get the you know xt32 with oh yeah i wouldn't worry about xt32 I, mean, I, I i would like both multi-q xt yeah. my, yeah, my thought was one of those morant slim lines i could go with that uh, that's a good you know, space saver. Yeah, the form yeah. factor in a bedroom, it looks nice. It's not going to be yeah. like overpowering visually. Yeah, you can probably Right, and actually it it's somewhere. probably around this it's it's probably a little bit wider but about the same size as the receiver you were using in your bedroom setup. Could so, 
because that other thing was about oh, that Oh, the size. Yamaha. Yeah, you had a Yamaha before, yeah. yeah. So I, I like a yeah. Morant slimline there because it gives you all the features. You, I mean, if you ever wanted to connect external power, it's got pre-outs for the front left right even. So right. it's, it's got all this stuff. And the price isn't crazy on those Morant slimlines, especially from accessories for less. So yeah, I would definitely get it I from like accessories that. for less. Yeah. He says we replace the plasma with an OLED these days, right? L- LG or Sony? Well, I mean, LG is the way we've been going, and, and yeah. OLED is the replacement for uh plasmas oh yeah so, yeah i yeah. mean um so the master series the a9f i mean i could totally get behind anyone buying one of those but the price i mean the price versus the right. lg the the main reason is i really like that dynamic tone mapping i think that's a uh key feature to have of, of which one the sony uh, so yeah, so if you want it on the Sony, only the Master Series has the dynamic tone mapping, oh, the right, active right, right. HDR. The lower uh, model numbers, the A8F and the A1E, uh, those don't have dynamic tone mapping. Only the A9F in the Sony Series does. So, I mean, if you got one of those, I'm like, cool, that's a fantastic OLED TV. It's just the price doesn't make sense to me. I'd, I'd go with an LG. And we know they fixed that little weird dimming issue it had. So that's all good. So he asks, any other audio video related thoughts given that he'll be renting for a few years? Yeah, dude, send us a picture of your room. We'll tell you what we think. Yeah, I mean, I don't think he's even settled yet. So uh, yeah, 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 exactly. So at this point, no. I wouldn't worry about anything else. I'd worry about stands, I guess. And, I mean, the only uh, thing is mm, a headphones, if he doesn't have any, it might make sense to get a nice pair of headphones. Sure. Because that, that'll last and you'll get plenty of use out of that. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's about it. Yeah. yeah. All right, Infinite Gary. Audioholics gave an overview of the Paradigm dif- def- Defiance. Defiance. Dude, that, I know. <laughs> I, I looked at the word. I looked at the word and I went, I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm like, yes, you do. It is Defiance. Nope, that's not it. I was like, I, was like, I kept running through all the permeations of my it's Defiance series like the of news, subwoofers. I see so many newscasters now saying subsequently. I'm like, wh- how did that become a thing that people say? People so, say that on purpose? Yes. I see it all the is time that, from newscasters. Is that English? Is that like UK based or something? Uh, no. That, I've never heard that. The word is subsequently. Subse- I have. It's always been subsequently. I don't know what's going on. I have seen so... And it's specifically newscasters. Is I it see like it a, all the time. Maybe they all pronounce bagel, bagel. All right. Um, <laughs> anyway, defiance. <laughs> Defiant series of subwoofers. The entry level V8 model is very basic, but all the other larger models include the ability to use the new Paradigm ARC app or full ARC software running on the PC with a Paradigm measurement mic. In the Oleoholics video, the Paradigm rep mentions that the ARC correction is not a replacement for starting with a with good subwoofer placement in your room. And Gene mentions that you might want to do the subwoofer crawl first and then apply ARC after finding a good spot. Or buy two of them so that you don't have to do that. <laughs> but what evs? Gary has an older paradigm subwoofer model. The what evs come. I have a friend whose daughter is 16 years old, and mm-hmm. like, apparently jelly is a thing. Don't be jelly. I, so I, I, I kind of I find the jelly humorous. Yeah, I, I like I, I like it when you're called peanut butter and jelly. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so that's starting to, to 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 seep into my brain whenever her and her friends are around. So, <laughs> I got whatever. it from Film Cow because his his Horseman cartoons they use jelly all the time. Horseman, Horseman Jack? No, just no. no it's uh, Film Cow is on YouTube and uh, and he, he, no the magical is. adventures of Horseman. I just love. They're like, I didn't know this was a costume party. He's like, what are you talking about? He's like, isn't that why you came as a jellyfish? <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about, but that sounds funny. <laughs> Gary has an older Paradigm subwoofer model, the Studio Sub 12, that came with the Paradigm Perfect Base Kit. I loved the name of it at the time. I love it even more now. At the at the time, it claimed that by taking multiple measurements with the mic in several different positions, it could optimize the bass and provide flat frequency response no matter where the subwoofer was positioned. Mm-hmm. So was uh, PBK doing something different from the new ARC model method? Or... Uh, is one of them better than the other? Yeah, the new one's probably better than the other. Maybe not. Maybe it is. Doesn't matter. The first time, they was lying. Because not necessarily <laughs> And they don't say it anymore. On purpose. If, if you read what's oh, yeah. on the website about the Perfect Base Kit now, they talk about placement first still, and then and yeah. then running the Perfect Base Kit. I, I don't think they were necessarily like... I, I'm sure there was somebody within the engineering department was like, that's not true. And the marketing guys were like, nah, it's close enough. <laughs> that's right? right. But we know a lot more now. Then this perfect base kit is 
has been around for quite a few years. We and, know. I mean, a, the perfect base kit now. was based on Arc. It was Anthem Room Correction, just under a different name, right. with its own separate little thing and its own separate little mic and all that. Uh, the new version um, that that they're talking about with these Defiant subwoofers, this Arc app. So they talked about you could actually just use the microphone that's built into your phone. Uh, the iPhone models are fairly well known, so they've already kind of tuned the app depending because it can detect what iPhone model you're using. Whereas on the Android one, they actually have you quote unquote calibrate your Android phone's microphone by doing a near field reading, and then you do your reading at your seats. And I'm like that doesn't that's, work, that's not gonna work with bass <laughs> in a room. It'll work outdoors, but it won't yeah. work in a room. Um, but if you do get the separate microphone, the USB microphone, uh, which comes with the the higher and more expensive X models in the Defiance, whereas the V models in the Defiant series, they don't come with a separate USB mic. But that mic is definitely less expensive and not as advanced as what used to come with the Perfect Bass Kit. Right. So... In terms of the microphone being used, the new version is definitely less expensive and probably not quite as accurate. It was a pretty advanced mic that came with that original Perfect Bass kit. So right. hardware-wise, I would say it's probably a bit of a downgrade. Downgrade. Software-wise, it's the same. It was always based on ARC. It remains based on ARC. That hasn't changed. Right. Yeah, you know, I mean... But either it, it, way, if you if you if you have created a null because of the placement, no EQ system anywhere. Dirac isn't going to help you. Perfect Base Kit isn't going to help you. Trinov isn't going to help you. If you have created yeah. a null, you cannot fill in a null with EQ. So placement always matters. Right. And like I said, I I, I don't want to a hundred percent throw them under the bus for and say that they were all you know lying out lying on purpose, but. The marketing guys oh, yeah, and yeah. the, the or gals and the the engineering side, I don't think you know they don't always communicate uh, or the lines of communication aren't always as clear as they should be. And the especially in marketing, they make claims all the time that I just flat out aren't true. Well, I mean, you know, it, like the number of watts an amplifier has uh, right. in, 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 on a receiver is almost always like way off. <laughs> <laughs> you can fudge those numbers. Uh, look yeah. at that distortion figure. But no, I mean, yeah. An Anthem and Paradigm used to laud, they used to brag about how their system was willing to boost the signal by I think as, as much as 9 or 12 dB or something yeah. like that. They like they talked about that as a because they're like, other EQ systems won't boost that much. And then over time, they like walk that back. <laughs> so, you know, th things do change over time. Sorry about all the clipping and protection right. modes. Yeah. <laughs> We're not doing that anymore. All right, Alan. Alan says over the past several weeks, he has bought a bunch of new gear, all AV rant at recommendations. He got a Denon X4400H receiver, an Epson 5040 UB projector, and a Sony X800 Ultra HD Blu-ray player. He's running a 7.2.4 configuration with in-ceiling speakers for Atmos. And since the X4400H only has nine amplifiers built in, <gasps> he's using an old receiver, his, an, a Denon X3, an X3000, to power his front left and right speakers as just a DOM amplifier. Mm -hmm. So Alan wanted to share a few issues that he ran into and then ask a few uh, questions. When he first got everything connected, he immediately heard a horrible buzz. So that's a almost certainly a 60 hertz ground loop. Yeah. That's usually what that is. And it is shockingly loud. <laughs> it is scary. <laughs> if you ever hear that for the first time, it's like, oh my God, what have I done? Holy moly. The first time I heard that, I was like, something's going to break. You know, <laughs> My subwoofer is going to die. Because 60 hertz, man, it comes out of that subwoofer at like a billion dB. <laughs> So uh, he never, uh, okay, he tracked it down to the 12 volt trigger. He never had any issue with his X3000's uh, 12 volt trigger to turn his dual SVS PP2000 subwoofers on and off. The new X4400H's 12 volt trigger being connected made a horrible buzz. Directly grounding the 12 volt trigger reduced the buzz, but he wasn't able to eliminate it completely until he used a 12 volt trigger on his APC power conditioner instead. So uh, yeah. this, now, I can't, we, it's almost 12 volt, uh, 60 hertz hums, you know, ground loops like this are very hard to track down. Yeah. Uh, they can come from any number of sources, but usually if you have things plugged into multiple outlets that are on different circuits, mm -hmm. that is, that is the source of your problem. I mean, it, it actually kind of indicates that if you were spending all the money 
uh, you would track down the electrical wiring in your house because it shouldn't actually do that. It shouldn't, but it's sometimes it does. And, oh, yes. it, and a lot of times it comes in through the cable box. Yes. You know, yeah. yeah, very much so. So, you know, it, I mean, I know you don't want to do this again, but uh, <laughs> if you replug everything in the way it was before and just unplug the cable from the back of your mm. cable box, does it go away? Because then there's your, there's your issue. That's it true. Had, it really yeah, because it, it, anywhere, because all of this stuff is connected electrically to each other. They all have yeah. some kind of cable going between them and not everything is connected with a fiber optic cable. We know that. So as long as you have electrical conductivity between these things and something, anything that should be grounded is not grounded to the exact same spot as everything else that is also grounded, then you're potentially going to have a difference in ground potential that creates that ground loop hum. So, yeah. Right. So all I mean, of these problems are the coming... It antenna sometimes. That happens yeah. too. So you're like putting things through the APC or, you know, we're going to see in the in, as we go on with this question, some of the stuff he had to do. Yet yeah, that can solve the problem, but the reality is you still have the ground loop. You still have right. the potential for that ground loop. Right. It's better to just figure out where it's coming from and fix it there than it is to, you know, do all these sort of patches that right. you're doing right it's now. It's a little curious, though, because he does have a subwoofer cable going between his X4400 and his PB, yeah. uh, his PB2000 subwoofers. That's an electrical connection. That apparently is not causing the ground loop all by itself. It's just the 12-volt trigger. So something, I mean, you're probably right. Something in that X4400 age, maybe a isn't grounded the way it ought to have been <laughs> right because it shouldn't it shouldn't do that yeah. so next he had temporarily connected a second hdmi cable between his old x3000 and the second input on his epson projector so they could see the x3000 menus having that second hdmi cable created a buzz <laughs> yes with it unplugged, there was no buzzing. Third, the x3000 and the x4400 share the same ir remote controls since he doesn't want it to, to anything changed on the x3000 he covered his ir sensors and hardwired the ir signal from his harmony hub just to turn the x3000 on and off but with that wire plugged in the x3000 would emit a, a beep every time a button was pressed on his harmony <laughs> remote <laughs> what a feature so this is, yeah, this is what we need. So he resorted to using his APC's master and slave outlet so that his X3000's outlets powers on and off whenever his X4400H is powered on and off. Finally, he's mad at himself because during the process of troubleshooting all these buzzing and beeping issues, he plugged and unplugged some cables while his X4400 was powered on. That's a no-no, by the way. It is. They even warn you in the manual not to do that. They do. But At one point, the tip of a trigger cable touched the exposed part of one of his speaker binding posts. Big spark, mm -hmm. and the X4400 went into protection mm -hmm. mode. So now he's wrapped the end of his banana plugs with electrical tapes. Why are the exposed end of banana plugs metal and conductive? Because it looks nice. And I, I agree. Maybe they yep. shouldn't be. I mean, but... that's one of the reasons I like Sewell's uh, yeah. strike or deadbolt banana plugs because they the barrel that is exposed is not electrically conductive. They put some plastic over it, which is not yeah. expensive or difficult to do. And that's one so of the reasons why I isn't like it, those. Why isn't it just the way that it is? But yes, you're not supposed to have anything yeah. touching anything back there when it's powered on. You're not supposed to plug or plug anything in. And honestly, dude, you should be thankful that you're doing this now and you didn't do it mm -hmm. 10 years ago because 10 years ago you lost the amplifier channel mm. guaranteed if you didn't fry your entire amplifier when you when you made this connection that you just made so it, i basically you know when i first before i started working for audioholics i did the exact same thing i oh, was yeah. yeah i was i was I've, I've, i had I've done it too <laughs> i lost a channel i lost a channel on my, my receiver doing that so i mean who among us you. probably hasn't i mean would sometimes you're trying to set things up you're trying to move a little more quickly you're like i don't do i really need to power cycle yet again yeah yeah you yeah, do you do so is there a simpler way to can, can control his x3000 uh to just turn it on and off maybe a menu setting so that it ignores all ir commands except for on and off um well, I mean, the way that we would normally suggest that you do this is just take, because usually with your hubs, you'll get like IR cables. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it comes uh, with a mini blaster, which isn't quite right. what you want, but they optionally sell what they call their precision IR cable. Uh, I think it's 25 bucks to get that. That plugs into the same port as where the mini IR blaster would usually go, but now it gives you four very teeny tiny little IR things that only go with what you stick. You stick them directly onto the IR sensor, and it only controls that one device. And you can program the Harmony Hub, because uh, it's got two 
um, like physical wire plug-ins, right. and you can tell it only control this device on that specific outlet. Uh, right. Don't control it via anything else. So you have now covered the IR sensor of the X3000. So when the normal IR commands are being blasted out for the X4400, the X3000 is not going to see those. And then when you send the command to turn specifically the X3000 on and off, it is only going to go through that one precision IR little thing. It seems like you should be able to take the, the little blaster they sell too and just put it right there and then like, he's already doing electrical tape, just cover that with I guess so. Tape. I mean, I, it, that it thing saves is, you 25 I, bucks. We we can't see it with our human eyes, but it is also shockingly bright. So yeah, it is really bright. You got to have some real, I mean, cover it with aluminum foil, honestly, because <laughs> you need it opaque. Yeah. So iron. it's easy to tell when Atmos is working. The receiver says so on its front panel, and he can hear sounds from his overhead speakers. But with 4K and HDR, he's only noticing a slight improvement over regular Blu-rays. And since there are so many settings on mm -hmm. between the X800 receiver, Denon receiver, and Epson projector, he's wondering if he truly set up everything correctly. Maybe the picture quality difference could be bigger. Is there a way to easily uh, confirm that he's getting the full quality 4K HDR signal coming out of his Epson? Well, I mean, usually on your source is where you you you'll see an info button or something like that price and it tells you what it's sending out. Now, yeah. what you're getting from you know what the receiver's doing and the Epson is doing, you know, I don't know, but the 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 source will usually tell you, you know, hey, you're getting Atmos, you're getting HDR, you're getting you know this bandwidth or whatever. Yeah. This bit, um, bit rate. You could actually do that times three because all three of those devices have their own info buttons. Well, there you go. Um, so the X800, definitely that'll work. That'll tell you what the player is sending out. That's good. Yeah. Uh, on the Denon, you would have to turn on its video processing, but then just leave everything as pass through because mm -hmm. otherwise it won't show you uh, the video information. It'll show the audio information, but it won't show you the video information unless you do turn on its video processing and then just set everything to pass through. But that will confirm, because uh, it actually, it very nicely, the Denim will tell you both incoming and outgoing. So that'll say, okay, here's what's coming in from the X800, and here's what I'm, the receiver, sending out. And then the Epson also has an info button, <laughs> and that'll show you um, the signal that it is at least receiving. So that'll let you confirm that. And what you're hoping to see would be a YCC signal uh, being sent with 10 or 12 bit, either is okay, coming out of the player, uh, at 422 chroma subsampling. That's the signal that you want to be sending all the way through. And it should say Rec 2020 in there somewhere as well for the color container. So those are all the, the bits of info you'd be looking for at all three stages. Then there's the one thing that actually might be the cause of all of this, which is that the 5040UB can accept an HDR10 signal. It has an HDR10 picture mode. It doesn't automatically switch into HDR10 picture mode when it receives an HDR10 signal. You must manually put it into the HDR picture mode. Um, he, he probably is already doing that because on a projector, the difference is not gigantic. Uh, if right. you're going to see anything, it's probably the wider color that you'll notice more than any more than the specular highlights. They're not that much brighter on a projector. Um, but yeah, that that could be the cause of it. Uh, I'll point you to uh, Chris Heinen's review of the 5040UB over at his website, which is Reference Home Theater, because he goes into some detail about putting the 5040UB into HDR mode. Um, so yeah, that might be a little bit helpful just on the projector side for you to make sure that that is set up correctly. Because the other two, the player should be, if you just go through the menus, you should be pretty certain that you're sending out the correct signal. The Denon is just passing it through. So it's right. mostly about the Epson having those settings correct. So as a final thought, he's been ple very pleasantly surprised by how much he likes Atmos, including using this Adobe Surround Up Mixer on regular 5.1 content. Speaking of which, I got to experience that as well last night when I was yeah. watching... Uh, Blade Runner 2049 on yeah. Voodoo through my Xbox One. And I was like, well, let's set it to Dolby Atmos. Because, I mean, that'll okay. give me... It, it's HDRX on there, so it should be 5.1 or 7.1 or something like that. So at least... No. It was 5 point, and it sounded garbo. And the surrounds so, came out of the surround backs. <laughs> the surrounds actually came out of the surrounds. Oh, okay. The surrounds came out of the wow. surrounds. Wow. That's good uh that that doesn't normally happen but the surrounds <laughs> did come out of the surrounds then uh but then i put it back in the stereo yep. and i got full all dolby atmos all the speakers all, all 11 speakers now all 11 speakers good old stereo uh, 
He didn't notice much of an improvement when he edits around back speakers. So based on things we've said, his expectations for Atmos were pretty low. But he thinks the upgrade has been really cool, and he'd recommend Atmos to anyone who's considering it. So there's a differing opinion to me. There you go. So, I mean, we have yeah. covered the whole spectrum of what people think and feel about Atmos. So uh, yeah. I, I guess it's, it's I, a case by case basis. It's really. going to be case by case. <laughs> it's pretty yeah. hard for us to generalize and tell you whether or not you specifically are going to like it. Yeah. All right, uh, John. John is a new AV Rant listener. He says he really enjoys the show, so thank you, John. Thank you, John. John bought his first 5.1 setup back in February with a Yamaha RX V681 receiver, ELAC debut towers, debut surrounds, and the more expensive Unify Series Center, plus an ELAC S12 EQ subwoofer and a 75-inch Sony mm. X900E LCD TV and an X800 Ultra HD Blu-ray player. That's all X8. nice gear. So yeah. That's a Panasonic, isn't the X800 a Panasonic? Nope, X800 so is the Sony. It's only, oh, yeah. Uh, so, UB820 so, so, so. is the Panasonic, right. yeah. Then in July, he decided to upgrade his AV receiver since he wasn't totally happy with the Yamaha. So he's got a Marantz S, uh, SR5012 now, and he bought a pair of ELAC Unified bookshelf speakers, which he moves between his desktop setup and using them as his front B speakers. So he has two sets of front speakers? Sometimes, yes. Because hmm. he, he never disconnects his debut towers, but he's like, right. once in a while, I'll put the Unify uh, bookshelf speakers as my front B instead. Okay. His room was 13 by 18 with a slanted ceiling and his setup uh, along one of the 18-inch walls. So that, was a little long. Yeah. that is a very narrow wall foot. otherwise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he sits about seven feet away. So does that mean that the TV's on the 18-foot wall? The TV is on the 18-foot wide wall. He okay. his, So front to back, his room is 13 feet. 13 feet, and okay. And he's seven feet away from the TV, so he's got some space behind him. He listens to a wide variety of music and plays a lot of games. He's tried to follow a lot of the audio advice that that's out there to maximize his, his, maximize his sound quality. For example, pu pulling his front speakers well away from any walls did seem to approve his soundstage and imaging. And having his surround speakers about one and a half feet above his head gave him a nicer sense of envelopment. But he still finds himself wanting to further upgrade, so he mm. sort of regrets trying to save a bit of money by going with the Marantz SR5012 instead of the 6012 that would have given him Multi-Q XT32 and the ability to use more than seven speakers. On top of his theater setup, he has a desktop setup too, where he also like an audio quality upgrade. <laughs> Plus, he's interested in upgrading his Sennheiser HD 558 uh, or whatever headphones. So he's wishing for improvements all around. Apparently, Christmas is coming and he's got lots of money. I mean, he's got... That's what it's going to take. He's got <laughs> nice gear. All of that he gear, does. I'm like, that's all nice gear. And he's just like, I want even better. <laughs> all right. So for the headphones, he's considering something like the Sennheiser HD 600 series or maybe the Audi's LCD 2s. Any suggestions on that front? Uh... Yeah, I'd go with all these, honestly. Yeah. That would be the, the larger difference, the bigger sound yeah. upgrade, but also the higher price. So that always comes in there. If well, you I mean, want... he's the one that recommended it, not us. That's so. true. I, I mean, I wouldn't steer you away from that. I certainly yeah. wouldn't. That that would be a, a definitely a difference from your HD 558s. Uh, you'll, your wallet will notice it too. Um, if you want something a little bit less expensive, that would also definitely be a difference. Uh, can once again mention those Hi-Fi Man uh, right. Sundera. Uh, $500 for those, also planar magnetic, uh, but $500 instead of $750 like the LCD2s are from Audis. Right. So that that could be a potential alternative. Um, probably the most linear headphones in that sort of price class that uh, Hi-Fi Man has ever put out. They're still not perfectly linear, but mm. uh, compared to what they, they used to make at that price point, probably the most linear and extended that they've done. So yeah, just an alternative. All right, any suggestions for a headphone amp DAC combo that could also maybe double as an amplifier for his desktop speakers? Mm. Uh, I yep. don't remember. What does my Stealth DC-1 do? I know it's a, it's a, it takes sources. It's a yeah. DAC. It's a headphone amp. Yeah, It's got sure. two outputs. I don't remember if it has amplifiers, though. Uh, well, I'm not even sure if they still sell that one. That's an they, Emotiva device, and they do sell something that will do all the things you asked for, which is their TA100. Uh, that's the model number now. Uh, so that's an integrated amp. It is a stereo amplifier to power speakers, um, has a digital and analog input. So it is also uh, a digital analog converter as well as just an analog preamp. And it does have a very nice headphone output as well. So that checks all the boxes. It's $400 though. Right. No, the the DC one does not have any speaker level output, oh, okay. so it could it could not do it. Okay, but the the TA one hundred will, uh, yeah, for four hundred dollars. But 
That's not that. I mean, nice desktop headphone amps are that price or more anyway. Yeah. And then they don't yeah. even power a pair of speakers for you. So yeah. uh, that that's where I'd point pretty much anyone for that. All, all of that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is that everything else? Okay. Uh, should he consider uh, adding external amplification to his theater setup? No. He noticed some Seven difference. Seven feet away, using, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, he, he noticed some difference using different amps for his uh, desktop setup. So would he find a similar difference to using different amps in his theater setup? Raw output doesn't seem to be an issue sitting only seven feet away. But if you were to upgrade a speakers, would an amplifier upgrade make a bigger difference? Well, it would depend on what speakers you got. If you got speakers that were extremely hard to drive, right? I would probably still say no, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> I'm also questioning whether or not there was a, uh, an objective difference a measurable difference between your desktop setup uh, well plus as well. in desktop setups you're often dealing with devices that are doing more than one thing yeah yeah so yeah. you know I, this is again the reason why we, we on this podcast are always like the the DAC chip inside of the device you know doesn't really whether it's a shark or an AKM or Texas Instruments or whatever like that makes discernibly no difference anymore They're, they all do the job and can crunch the numbers and do the math and not output high levels of noise and distortion it's not the DAC chip inside but there are devices that people refer to as DACs that can sound different from one another but they're not just a DAC chip they are also an amplifier or they are also an EQ or whatever they do multiple things so right. at a desktop set it's highly likely that whatever device you're using whatever amplifier you were using to power your stereo speakers uh, i mean first of all you could be going from a really low powered high noise one to a much better one and you'll definitely hear that or it could be that it's multiple things it's also a dac or it's also an eq or something like that um so yeah and your home theater setup seven feet away i no, you I, of all the things that will make an audio difference, changing your speakers will make a big difference. Changing your room will make a big difference. Changing your subwoofer setup will make a big difference. The amplifier is way down the list. Right. So after he got the Unify bookshelf speakers and tried using them as his front B speakers, he knows they do seem to match his Unify center a bit better than his debut series towers. But his debut towers still sound fuller for music listening. Mm. So maybe he should get the Unify towers and just keep his Unify bookshelf speakers at his desktop full time. Uh, there, to me, this sounds like you're listening like through uh, pure direct. I or know. Direct. It's it, it sounds, sounds like it you're sounds turning like... your subwoofer off during music listening time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you're doing that, then you are hamstringing the bookshelf speakers, and mm. really, you should always be using your sub. Yes. Always. Yes. Always. With a crossover, mm -hmm. don't set those those towers to full range. You should always be using your sub. And because you're sitting seven feet away, yeah. if you had asked me what if you needed towers, I would have said no. 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you could just get rid of those towers and put the, the bookshelf speakers in there. And I think that would sound great. And again, we know he's been following audio advice that you'll find commonly mentioned on forums and online and that. And you will see so many people talking about two channel. You have to listen without a sub. It has to be full range towers. Like if it, no. I wouldn't blame anybody for following that advice because it is so prevalent online. So we're telling you something different. <laughs> from all of that advice that's out there. Uh, yeah, I mean, even, you know, people I highly respect have said that stuff. So I, I completely disagree with the idea of not using your sub. I mean, again, the subwoofer is, it's part of your room. That's the, really the only way to think of it. They right. are inseparable, the subwoofer in the room. So it doesn't make sense to ever turn it off. Right. So to me, yeah, the, uh, you're looking for a difference in sound quality you're looking for yeah. an upgrade in yeah. sound quality right now you're you're thinking laterally i think mm. you know mm. i mean yes your debuts if you think that your elac the the unify bookshelf speakers sound that they match better with your center right well then play them with the subwoofer yes and then compare them back and forth with the debut with the debut towers and then to say to yourself which do i like better mm-hmm and if you really do like the, the bookshelves better, get rid of the towers and buy right. another set of bookshelves. Right. That's what you should do. Yeah. But if you really want to change in sound quality, mm. you just have to buy new speakers yeah. all the way around. And since and that's what that's you expensive. have is already good, yes. uh, this is not going to be cheap when you want to No, no, to you're, gonna, that's, you're definitely going to put out some money. Yeah. So, and it's going to be like the difference from whatever you had before to your current ELAC setup 
that was probably a big change. And you're like, oh right. man, can I get even better? It's like, you can get a little better. I'm not going to tell you there's no such thing as anything that sounds even a little better than those speakers, but diminishing returns big time. Right. You're going to pay a lot more money for a much smaller gap in performance. So he's running a 5.1 and using the remaining two channels to have his front B option. Should you go with 7.1 instead or maybe try 5.1.2 with front heights? Well, I would never suggest front heights. <laughs> I don't think front heights makes that much of a difference. <laughs> but if you're going to do 5.1.2, the, the point two should be middles. Top sure, middles. top middles, yeah. You know I mean, I mean the thing is, he actually has seven speakers on hand. Yeah. So you can try all of this without putting out any money. It's right. you know it's going to be some time definitely, but you can and you speaker can, wire, and yeah, speaker wire, yeah. But that's right. that shouldn't be a big investment unless he's listened to some really bad advice on the internet about speaker wire. Hopefully not. Oh, okay. Don't do Hopefully that. Not. Just buy some mono price or buy some from Parts Express from Belden. But uh, yeah, uh, you can. I would recommend giving it a try. You can set up seven point one right right now. You have seven speakers on hand, so give right. it a try. So overall, what uh, should he upgrade in his theater at this point to really take his audio quality to the next level? Mm. Well, if you're not willing to buy a whole new surround, a whole new speakers, right? I mean, the the thing that's immediately jumping out to me is uh, you only have one subwoofer. Yes, yes. that's the that's the first thing. Although I would do. And, it's probably just the one main seat that he cares about, so it, it could be. But you know, I, so either, either. Uh, buying a second subwoofer so that, I mean, we don't know what, he just told us the dimensions of his theater space, right? It could be that it's open to the rest of the universe. Right, right. So we don't know. If we're assuming a 18 by 13 enclosed rectangular right, room. Right, right. Which means that you could place two subwoofers in such a way that you would get good even base across or, you know, yeah, even base across all the seats. But maybe that's not the case. So... Either you buy a second subwoofer or you spend a lot more time making sure that your subwoofer is in the best place for yes, your For seat. your one seat, yes. And go with that. You know what I would, because I mean, he's clearly into this, right? This is not yeah. a, I'm a super casual, I just want something I throw up and plug in and it all works for me. He's, he's the opposite of that. I think what might make sense for you right now, because um, we don't know how much his room situation is going on. You know, often acoustically treating your room we will appreciate the difference but it's not as large a difference usually as completely changing your speakers or that but more more of a difference than changing your amplifier i'll promise you that much but i think getting some measurement equipment might be reasonable because we're talking about really just a calibrated usb mic from cross spectrum labs so that's about 100 bucks about 100 bucks a little over 100 bucks uh and Honestly, just starting with the mic and the free Room EQ Wizard software, just to see what kind of delay times uh, do you have, you know, even decay times uh, that are going on in your room. What does your frequency response look like at your seat? Do you have any big humps or dips in your bass response from your single subwoofer? I mean, I mean, if he's handy, he should be looking to at making at DIY room treatments. Yeah, exactly. I yeah, think. but it'd be nice to see what's going on with your decay times right now, right. Uh, which he could do. So, I mean, I think. For a person like this, that's a reasonable investment that he would get use out of and probably enjoy the process. So right. I, I could see doing that because that'll give you more information to make even better decisions as you move forward. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, Nathan. Nathan's parents have a nice setup with a 65-inch LG B7 OLED, a Denon X4300H receiver, and an Oppo 203 Ultra HD Blu-ray player, all controlled with the Harmony Elite remote. Do they listen to the podcast? Because it sounds Nathan like they does. listen to the, It <laughs> sounds like they listen to the podcast. I'm guessing Nathan had something to do with that, with that setup. No. Naturally, Nathan wants to adjust everything to maximize the quality, but calibrating the TV leaves it looking a bit dim during the daytime, and they do watch TV at different times with different lighting, so Nathan thinks it makes sense having a day mode and a night mode. Mm -hmm. He set them up with a Harmony Elite to make using the system as easy as possible, so he'd like to know, is there a super easy way to let them toggle between a day and night mode? Um, yes? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> it's gotta um, be I mean it's harmony you can do anything with it if you well, try hard well sure enough. <laughs> I mean there, there, so you don't have a discrete command where it's literally one button press that'll move right, between right. two different picture modes so it's not quite that simple you can for sure because I've done this with my own B7 and my parents C7 uh, set up a sequence uh, so on the harmony remotes within any activity you can set a sequence 
uh, which basically means you press one button on the touchscreen and the Harmony sends out multiple commands sure. to whatever devices. So that we used to call this a macro, right? The one button sure. press and it does multiple commands. So now they call it a sequence. So I can see why this is a little tricky because someone might be saying, okay, how hard is it really to press the settings button, go down to picture mode and move between day and night mode? No, I, I think that, but, you see, to me, I would set up like, you know, day mode, night mode, you know, for each activity that you want to do. That's just and then it. When you, yeah. When you hand the remote to your parents, you know, you're like, if you're watching it during the day, press this button. And you want to watch TV, press the TV day, TV night. Right. You know, watch movie day, watch movie night. Yeah. That's the way I would set it up. Is there something better there's, than that? Well, there's one little problem with that, though, which is we can envision the scenario where they're watching during the day. And they press this thing that says go to day mode, right? So what the right. sequence will have to... So with the LGs, the way their menu is set up is that it'll press settings. You'll go down with the down arrow to the picture mode. You'll click OK. Uh, and then you can move side to side and it will scroll through all the picture modes, but it wraps. So once oh. you get to the end, it goes back to the so beginning. So it's not a discrete command for it's that. It's not then. a discrete command. So the problem is... Let's say they were already in the night mode and then they pressed go to night mode, which is easy enough to do. You just press the wrong button. Now it's going to move you to the wrong picture mode right? because it was already on night mode. And you say go so to night mode, which moves it the wrong direction. Um, so, and, right. so, I mean, you can keep pressing that button to get to where you want to be. But I would basically set up a sequence to say go from bright to dark, go from dark to bright, and then let them know if it goes to the wrong mode just keep pressing the button and it'll eventually get you there because it'll just keep moving along the selections in fact one thing you might want to do since nathan is probably a person willing to do this is make every other picture mode other than the two that you want them to use just completely desaturate the color and turn the brightness and contrast all the way down so that there is no question that it is horribly wrong Right. right. There's no way they could possibly look at it and go, oh, that's fine, whatever. I don't want to press the button. I'll just keep watching it. Like, just make the all the other picture modes so bad that they can't possibly watch it that way. And then they will have to keep pressing the button to get to one of the two good modes. That That's that's my workaround for it. I wish it were easier. Right. Uh, whenever a TV or any device, honestly, these days doesn't have a discrete command, yeah. IR command for ev every single thing on there, it's just like a big middle finger to <laughs> the end user. It's like we're too lazy to come up with yeah. a six-digit code that an IR blaster can send out. It, it's, it's, it's unnecessary. But there's one I mean, other thing, which is that these OLEDs, they do have a room light sensor, and it will automatically, if you use that mode boost or yeah, lower and then somebody opens a door and the light floods in their room and it changes the thing or I'm, somebody walks in front of the tv casts a shadow and suddenly the, it, the tv changes but i'm betting brightness. nathan's parents don't care as much as nathan does <laughs> So it could be. If all their be. if all they're like is, you know, at night it looks great, during the day it's a bit dim, which is totally true. Then or you know what you do is you just set it for daytime mode and then all if the they time. don't comp if they don't complain that, that, that at, night at night it's too bright, then you're just like that's just the way it looks, more. I mean it, it, it is that is what I did for my parents. I set one picture mode that's bright enough for full yeah. daytime viewing. It's not eye searingly bright or anything, but then at night it's a little brighter than it really should be, but it's not it doesn't hurt your eyes. So I'm like there, middle ground and I left it there. That's probably what I would do too. Yeah. All right, Bob. Bob says his ears are getting older now, so high frequencies are rolling off and he's having some issues understanding dialogue. He's using a Sony 3000 ES receiver that he is already preparing to upgrade to a Denon and he has a, has Snell speakers for his LCR. Does Snell still make speakers? No, they are gone. I have not heard. Yeah. yeah. They made some decent speakers. They, they were did. Expensive. That, that was where the whole Dapolito array came from was yeah. Snell. Uh, he's tried changing a number of things in this room and to try and improve the situation in his current setup. He's moved his couch four feet away from the back wall. And he's positioned his front left and right speakers further away from any walls as well. He sits about eight to nine feet from the speakers, but the dialogue issues persist. He's got a budget of around $2,000 just for speakers. The receiver upgrade is already in the works. And he'd like to know if we think a speaker upgrade would help him out. Music listening is only about 10% of his usage, so this is mostly about TV and movies, and dialogue especially. That said, he prefers extremely accurate response, and he, he liked towers, but he knows bookshelf speakers would probably fit his budget better. He's only got a two-point-something system. Is that what I'm gathering from this? Uh, no, I believe it's surround sound, but he's just 
concern with the front three because, of course, okay. that's where your dialogue... I mean, the dialogue predominantly comes from the center. Occasionally, I guess it moves to the front left or right, here or there, but... So he's looked at what's available from Accessories for Less, and he's potentially interested in the Focal Aria series or Canton. He's considered a San Dionadio in Ravel, but uh, what he'd like to hear, what he'd like from us, is to narrow down his choices to just uh, two for him to bring in an audition. He says he doesn't have time or inclination to bring in three or more sets for lots of comparisons. So if we were to boil, boil it down to just two sets of LCR speakers, what would we suggest? Um, I okay, so I I understand what you're saying about your hearing and stuff. Snow speakers are real nice. <laughs> you know, Those were good. Yes, I'm I, I, yeah. I, I'm having a really hard time believing that the speakers are mm. the primary primary problem here. To me, I would be worried about center channel placement because you talked about all yep. the rest of it. Yep, and I would worry about hard, flat, reflective surfaces behind me. And first reflection points, to be honest, sure, as well. Sure. So I would love. I would. I would more rather spend that two thousand mm. dollars on some room treatments and perhaps dealing with however your center channel is placed. Mm. So if you could tell us how that, if it's like recessed inside of a right? cabinet, or even sitting on top of a TV stand but push back, right? It, that could be making more difference than mm -hmm. anything else. I have a very hard time swallowing whole hog that the speaker right are the problem here yeah like if you were like oh i'm using uh home theater in a box and the dialogue isn't very clear i'd be like okay that could be the speakers yeah i've got these these this, this little you know two inch driver inside of right a, you know or full range driver inside of a box you know a, a sound a bar or box. the speakers that are built into the tv like any of those right. things or a bose system right <laughs> like, i spent a lot of money and got a bose system everyone said it was the best but i can't tell what people are saying like yep that all makes sense it's the speakers but yeah i have to agree i mean given that it's snell speakers yeah it's it's uh, not that it's impossible uh, or given age, who knows? Maybe a surround is blown on one of the woofers <laughs> at this point, or something. You know, like we we can't say for certain. Right. That I mean, speakers oh, couldn't make a I, difference. I but. mean, the 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 mid range driver, the tweeter in the center, could right. be Jacked or something like that. I don't know. We don't know. Could be, but I don't think that a fully functioning right. Snell speaker right. should have dialogue intelligibility Agreed. problems. Agreed. So. Uh... Yeah, yeah. God, but I I mean, would, again, I yeah. mean, do we do we want to spend all this money on room treatments in that when we don't know for sure? I mean, we have to diagnose first. We have to diagnose. Otherwise, yeah. we're spending money that potentially isn't the very best usage of those funds. We need some pictures. Send us some pictures, mm -hmm. number one, and let us take a look at your setup, how it looks in your current room. Don't worry about cleaning. We don't care. No. We are going to show God, the pictures. No. Us? Our theaters? We don't I have care. a pile of blankets that my wife refuses to take out of this home theater because she's uh, like, today I want the blue one. Today I want this one. Today I want that one. I want all the blankets in here. I'm like, okay. We are so Believe like me. the contractor whose own house is a mess. Like, yeah. all we do is talk about theaters. Our own theaters are messes. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I let, let's say, if someone came to me and said, I don't have any speakers and what I care about is extreme accuracy and dialogue clarity and I've got about two thousand dollars to spend like i would point that person at the top of their budget to ascend sierra twos which sure. amazingly are actually on sale right now <laughs> like i never wow. thought we'd see a sale on those but you could actually get three sierra twos from ascend right now uh right i think it's about twenty one hundred dollars mm. so that's around two thousand dollars uh i mean i would point someone to that because if you want extreme accuracy and clarity pretty hard to beat those speakers for that price point i, I can right. point someone there rbh is something i would point anybody to like that impression elite series because again those speakers are the type where i would go if you don't like the way this sounds it's something else it's not right. the speakers and th at, that would be at a lower price point um, right so yeah. like you could even get three of the r515es so that you have three identical speakers they have the woofer tweeter woofer design. You can use them vertically or horizontally and great drivers, great design. If you don't like how that sounds, it's not the speaker's fault. So either, I mean, if you want two, that's my two. Those are the two I would tell somebody who do audition. Yeah, I would have gone RBH straight out the box. Uh, it's just a no-nonsense uh, yeah. recommendation that just it's safe. It's not too expensive. Yeah. You know that the speakers are accurate. Right. You know that the speakers are flat. You know the speak. You know that that. But I really believe that we can get 
this problem fixed by spending yeah. l- a couple hundred bucks you know, I mean, in a little bit of time. Would it even make sense to like literally just bring in a single R515 Elite um, and make sure that that as your center speaker is set up properly and just hear what that does? Because as far as a, a potential loss of cash and shipping charges, that's minimizing it. And mm-hmm. we know that that speaker as your center, if dialogue isn't clear, it's not the speaker. I, I wouldn't order a single thing until we had seen this, the pictures okay, of this room. fair enough. Yeah. I mean, that's just me. I mean, I, I, I now imagine he's in a glass box and he has buried his center channel. <laughs> yes, and of, even though you're four feet away from your back wall, it's still reflecting like crazy. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, 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 need to see, I need to see the room. All right, Adam. Adam wants to install a f- setup in his family room, and he says his only option for where he can put speakers other than his front left and r- uh, left center right is in the s- ceiling. Mm. He's got a Marantz SR70, uh, 7009 that can power up to nine speakers and process up to 11, although it can't do DTS-X. can only do Atmos. And during Black Friday, he bought ELAC Debut 2.0 front left, left right and center speakers an svs sb12 and a steve subwoofer mm-hmm. how big is this room you didn't tell us yet uh and four sonnets in ceiling speakers so he has 7.1 speaker combo ready to go how would we suggest deploying those four in ceiling speakers i'm not gonna like what i'm about to say does <laughs> traditional 7.1 with both surrounds and surround backs all being in ceiling even make sense he's thinking having 5.1.2 would be better but it would still be in ceiling surrounds and then a, t- a, p- a pair of top speakers somewhere where we recommend. Uh, to me, it's very hard to do at most when you're putting your your surround surrounds speakers in the in ceiling. The ceiling. Yeah. I really, would, if you had asked me beforehand, I would have said you should buy five, you know, your front three, sure. your surrounds, and you're done. Um, oh, I see. You can't. <laughs> I don't think that you. I mean, the only other speakers I would be okay with you putting up there would be the, the surround backs because they're far enough away. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, you could yeah. do front heights or top top fronts, fronts. But I honestly, mean, yeah, in sound surrounds quality, and top middles is that going to yeah. make sense? <laughs> no, they're going to be like feet, yeah. inches away from each other. So, you know, if it were me, I would just stop with the five point one. Maybe go to seven point one if you really want to. Yeah, I don't think it's going to make a huge difference. I would take those other two speakers and either send them back, or I would box them up and save them for if something goes wrong, or use them as a zone two for distributed audio in a different room. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I can I can see the argument for front, middle, back, right? Which would be your traditional seven point one, right? When you when you're Surround speakers are going to be above you anyway. Yeah, having another pair up there as tops of some kind for Atmos, uh, discerning the direction of the sound isn't going to make a huge difference. So, uh, you know, right. d- we don't know the full room size. He's saying the only option is in ceilings, which makes me think this is probably an open space. Called it a family room. So it's right. probably open common center or something. So I, I could see the argument if it's a fairly large space of being like, okay, I've got my front speakers in front of me. I got my surrounds that are in my ceiling and to my sides. And then I've got another pair of speakers that are in my ceiling and well behind me. Because right. that, at least that'll give you a sense of forward to back motion. Sure. Uh, so yeah, if you were gonna do it, I'd probably just do seven point one. Yeah, Rob, not this one, a different one. Mm-hmm. Rob has an C six LG OLED, a Marantz SR sixty ten, and the Oppo two hundred three. He was happy when the Dolby Vision firmware update finally arrived for his Marantz receiver, but he's mm-hmm. having some erratic playback with the two hundred three. Oppo 203 connected directly to his C6 OLED. Dolby Vision plays perfectly, but with the Oppo going to his Marantz and then Marantz to the TV, the OLED seems to occasionally lose the HDMI connection. Is this a common problem? Do the slightly older Marantz receiver, receivers have a Dolby Vision pass-through problem? Uh, I don't know, but this sounds like video processing to me. I mean, this is the first thing that came to my head would be make sure there's no video processing on in the Marantz, but other than that, I don't know. So I haven't seen large reports of this. I only have two Ultra HD Blu-rays that are Dolby Vision <laughs> Ultra HD Blu-rays. So I don't have a huge sample size. Hasn't happened to me, but it's not like I've watched those movies every day. But I don't, I'm not going to blame this on the receiver because I think is actually might be an HDMI cable problem. Could be. Yeah, sure. Uh, because when you're doing this, since the LG OLEDs are capable of accepting a 12-bit signal... That is, if what your Oppo is set to automatic, 
it'll output 12-bit when it's Dolby Vision, because that's actually how uh, it's encoded, uh, which means it requires more bandwidth through the cable. And you're like, okay, the OLED connected directly to the OPPO, that worked, but that was using the cable that came with the OPPO, which we know is a... Uh, premium certified, the full 18 sure. gigabits per second. We don't know what cable you were using to go between your Marantz and your OLED, and it might have been the regular high-speed HDMI cable that tops out at 10.2 gigabits. And now when a 12-bit signal is trying to be passed through that, he's like, it works some of the time, and occasionally it drops out. I'm like, that sounds like maybe a bandwidth issue. So yeah. it might be as simple as replacing the cable between your Marantz and your TV. If that was a little bit older, the one you were already using worked with everything else, including maybe other 4K sources, but now it's probably 12-bit and higher bandwidth. That's my suspect, because this isn't a common problem on I'll be honest with you. This is, uh, this is exactly my issue with upgrading to a 4K projector, yeah. because my HDMI cable is yeah. in the wall, <laughs> and I don't have a clue if it's ever going to pass through. Yeah. I mean, if you're sticking than... with only 24 frames per second, it should. It's never going to be Dolby Vision, so always make sure it's 10-bit, not 12. Should. <laughs> it was a long cable, too, man. I know. And, which... uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not. I'm feeling very You didn't take our own advice and do it in conduit. No, Silly it's because... And I know. And the reason I didn't do it was because the dude, you know, literally I called some friends and they and they said, yeah, we can come down tomorrow mm -hmm. and do the wall. I'm like, okay, uh, mm. what do we got to do? And, you know, I, I just didn't do it. I, I honestly don't think conduit would have worked because it's not through right. ceiling. Nah. It's It, it makes uh, one, two, three, four, <laughs> five, six, Ooh. seven. Turns. Right hand turns. Dude. Yeah. 90 degree turns. I don't think. And at the time, worked. I don't think that uh, little mini connector on the fiber optic that Mono Price sells was even available. So No, it wasn't. Yeah. All right, Josh. Josh has an SVS PP2000. He says it sometimes sounds as though it is blown. He'll hear, he'll sometimes hear a rattling coming from inside and hardly any output from the sub, but then he'll move the sub and plug it into a different wall outlet and suddenly it's working fine again. Any thoughts? It's okay. I don't know what the inside of SB2000 looks like. I'll be honest. A PB2000 right. look like. But this sounds like there's something in there. <laughs> you know, or you something know. has come loose. It's loose. not impossible. I mean, SVS is so I would good in them. their customer service. I yeah. would call them right away. I get it. Not every brand am I like eager to call them. Yeah. Right? And maybe the, Josh is just thinking along those lines. But like, SVS, I'm like, you did it. You got a problem, you just call them because they, they will do everything they can to help you. This sounds like there may be okay, so <laughs> something got in, in that some, port. <laughs> in some of the in some of the uh sometimes what they'll do is they'll take the amplifier and they'll encase it in a plastic backing box. Right. right? I don't know if they do this with SVS or not. Uh, but not that I've seen. Although it's pretty but, compact, it's all digital. Yeah. Oh. So, you know, there is a connector that goes from the driver mm -hmm. to and it's like a speaker wire yeah. driver to the amplifier. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's inside there. And if one of those connections is a little bit loose, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. as the, the subwoofer plays, it could be pulling it away either through heat as the wire heats up, it kind of bends mm -hmm. it back. And then, you know, it goes kind of crazy and sound, and then the output goes down. Or uh, it's just shaking it loose. Mm -hmm. And you moving it is just letting it cool down or letting it go, you know, fall back into place so that's making that contact. It could be as easily easy as taking out the amplifier, tighten up all the wires, and you're good to go. Possibly. I would 100% call SVS yep. and tell them what you're experiencing. Yeah. Because I think that they will, they'll, they'll either send you a new unit or they'll... Uh, or talk you through a fix. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the fact that it does work sometimes, I mean, it could be that an amplifier is becoming faulty. It's almost certainly not that the driver is becoming faulty because that like never happens with SVS subs. But, well, not only that, you know, it would not be intermittent. If the driver is, right. if the driver is damaged, it is damaged all the time. Sure. <laughs> it's not damaged. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, I, I had a sub before where it, not a completely dissimilar, but I would hear around sometimes I opened it up and uh, yeah, there was a screw that got in there and it was yep. like falling on and off the magnet. <laughs> So. <laughs> there you go that'll do it yeah, that'll do it that'll do it i've had legos in my absolutely before. boshko what's our favorite canadian made speaker company yeah. what you got? i don't know all of them i mean True. there's probably some we don't even know there's there's i mean i, I would have to see a complete list <laughs> uh 
Is a send? Nope. It's Canadian? No. Nope. He's in California. A Pyrian? Nope. They're in Ohio, I think. I don't have a favorite Canadian. Really? All so. those Canadian brands, all that NRC research. Can't think of a single I know. one. I mean, there's lots of them. There I are. I mean, there's Paradigm. You used to like Axiom a whole lot. Not so hype on them anymore. Yeah, until they raised their prices and didn't yes. change the quality of the speakers. Paradigm is an easy answer. Years. I mean, they... Yeah, apparently it's kind of pricey. A little bit kind of pricey. pricey. They don't have, I their guess. monitor series is pretty reasonable. What's, what's the other ones? The PSBs? Is that there right? you go. And that's that surprisingly, even they don't get mentioned that much on this podcast. You don't hear me recommending them all the time, but that's probably my answer. PSB is probably my favorite Canadian made speaker company. I like their products. They've got the best Atmos upward firing modules if you ever want upward firing modules that actually work because. They're the only ones who built them to Dolby spec. So good on you, PSB. And they actually work. So yeah, that's my answer is PSB. All right, I'll go with that. Andrew <laughs> on Facebook. Andrew is making YouTube content and he says he appreciates that the audio quality in our complete two-hour videos is clean and sounds good. So we'd like to know what recording equipment do we use and what software? For the audio? Uh, so what yeah. are you using for audio? I have, I'm going to look at it here. It's an Audio-Technica... AT, what does that say? 2005 USB microphone. Uh, it actually can take both an XLR regular uh, connection and a USB connection, which I make use of since I'm using two computers to do this silliness, uh, which kind of leads into the software that we're talking about. I just use Audacity to record the audio. Uh, he was wondering like, oh, how do you get rid of the noise? I'm like, I use their noise reduction tool. <laughs> you uh, highlight over a blank space. So I just leave some blank space at the beginning and the end with uh, room sound. Uh, take that as my noise profile and then apply their noise reduction. And it, it cleans things up darn nicely, even when you hear little fan noise during the summer in my room. So uh, yeah, that's the software. Uh, let's see what else. I'm using ManyCam, which we're going to try to get away from, but got it working again. So I'm using it this week because I'm already familiar with it. We're going to see if something works better than that. Uh, and then, yeah, YouTube Live, Google Hangouts. That's that's how we're talking to each other. So that's my gear. So I've got a Audio Technica AT2020, I think is what this is. I couldn't okay. put a number on it, but it's here someplace. I think yeah, it's yours is a condenser mic, right? Mine is a dy yeah. mine's a dynamic microphone. A ha mine's a, a condenser. Mic, yeah. uh, I've got this. You know, I've had different pop filters, but I've got a yeah. new pop filter. I mean, I really need just a. I'm just using a it. wind sock. I really need a proper pop filter, but I uh, I got a shock mount for it, which uh, I love. I love the shock mm. mount. Uh, it makes it so that I can touch the mic and move it around right. while I'm talking without that bonk. those vibrations going <laughs> into the mic. Bonk, bonk, uh, bonk, I have bonk. a PreSonus. I'm afraid to touch this thing, but we're <laughs> going to touch it anyways. A PreSonus Audio Box 44 BSL preamp which is a usb preamp that connects a, a listener sent that to me it's more than i need right right uh i if i were to do, if i were to buy gear right now if I, what's going on with the stupid cable okay if i were to buy gear right now i would get a usb mic like you have mm -hmm, mm -hmm. audio technica probably the same yep. one or very similar to what you have and uh the, the recording software i use is uh reaper okay. to record and i still use audacity to edit right uh i do not use noise removal on my end uh, yeah, not, I, I record in my home theater, yeah. so it's pretty dead in here, and there's very little. I turn off the fan, and that's why I'm sometimes very hot and complaining about it constantly. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's nice and cool today, so yeah. I don't have to worry about that. Uh, and then I, on Rob's end, I usually use a, uh, a compressor uh, uh, through Audacity, and on my end, I'll use a normalizer in the compressor. But uh, it's still to, all Audacity as far as what it's all software Audacity. is actually being used, yeah. Yeah. So Reaper is just doing the recording right now. And the reason I did that was uh, Audacity was it was messing up. And right. It was very, I mean, was very irritating. None of our stuff is expensive, really. I mean, your your mic and your preamp are pretty pretty good the prices. The preamp but... is expensive. I would never would have paid that much right. for it. Because and it's, I don't, and it, it's like got you four say, inputs. It's not like you and... truly needed that no. for your purposes. So No. But uh, I've been using the same mic since day one of this podcast. Right. <laughs> this podcast, I think it's a hundred dollar mic or something. Like when that. I, and I've got whatever this arm thingy is here to put it here. Right. For this. When I do use um, an XLR connection on this microphone, uh, my preamp so that I can turn it into a USB input to get it into my computer, I use the USB Dual Pre from the company called Art. So uh, mm. 
that that's a nice inexpensive does a really nice job microphone preamplifier even has phantom power if your mic needs phantom power so that's a which nice mine does one. yeah yeah which mine does so if i'm making youtube com uh content and I'm like, oh, and I guess cameras too, right? So oh, I've got yeah. the Logitech HD 1080p one, which is just, and I have it mounted on the, uh, which I've kicked the tripod twice uh, <laughs> during this podcast, which I normally don't do. But uh, I've got it on the tripod pod, and my computer sits right underneath it on a speaker stand because yeah. that's what I've got. And I'm sitting on one of my dinner, on my dining room table chairs. So, you know, it's just, it's not very comfortable, but I'm sitting on it. I've got a uh, Microsoft Life Cam, whatever the one that was 720p resolution, cinema something or other, cinema HD or whatever. I don't think you even get it anymore. Oh. And I hate it. I hate it. And the whole reason I got it is because there was a Windows update because you use Mac, right? Yeah. So For now. There, there was a Windows update that killed all Logitech webcams for like three months. And I was using a Logitech webcam at the time. So I'm like, all right, I need a webcam that actually works. I'm like, okay, Microsoft branded webcam. Surely that'll work. And it, it functions. I've never had it not function. It's just can't adjust anything on it. Every time there's a Windows update, it like gets all screwy and I have to reinstall the drivers. And I'm like, really? Microsoft, you can't make Windows work with your own branded webcam? So yeah, I won't, I won't recommend that. <laughs> oh, and uh, for recording my video end, I record on OBS, which is a free okay. software. So software-wise, Minicam costs like 60 bucks or something like that when I bought it for us. I right. think it's something like that uh, for like a lifetime membership, yeah. whatever. But we're, th that lifetime is about to end because they <laughs> moved on to a different pro platform. OBS <laughs> is free. Uh, if you get the version I've got, which is open broadcast software. Yeah. It's what most streamers and YouTubers use to record things. Uh, Audacity is free. Yes. Reaper is technically free. though. You, <laughs> Constant I, I have, evaluation. I have been evaluating it for quite some time. <laughs> I really need to figure out how to edit, and it, it is mm. much more powerful. It, and in fact, I would highly, if you're not doing it yet, I would highly recommend you use Reaper and then pay for it. But use Reaper instead of Audacity, because I think it's closer, it operates closer to Pro Tools, which is the high-end software. I used to use a, when I first started this thing, uh, somebody gave me a, a key for Pro Tools that I use for a bit, and Pro Tools is awesome. Now, I found out it was pirated, so I deleted it, but I used Pro Tools for a little bit, and I Audacity is, it's just nowhere near, and Reaper, I think, is a little bit better. It's a lot, it's a lot less resource intensive, which is okay. why I use it to record, because right. my, my laptop's kind of old, so, I mean, almost 10 years now. Uh, is that right? to check that anyways it's uh it's been around for a bit and i needed something that that wouldn't hog up a bunch of resources so yes i switched to uh reaper basically because audacity was slowing everything down to the point where i couldn't <laughs> do anything yeah you know, I, could, I couldn't even scroll the the noise the question the question list i mean because it was taking it's everything so long so all right, that's it for this week, Rob. What oh, we got? okay. I, was, I thought we had enough time to do this last one. but Is, there, is, yeah. is it the, the last question? It's the last one, but it's it's long, but it's all placement stuff, so I don't know. All right, hold on a second. Let me scroll back down. I, I thought, know it I, thought, I know it looks ridiculously it, it looks long. Like, it, but it looks like it's you know a third of the way from the bottom of the page it's here. Just, it's, it's just placement questions. I think all we right. can nail it. Let's try all it. All right, let's do it real quick. I'm just getting hungry. Woo. JR. JR says he's a truck driver. Woo! So, you know, lots of bass. Yeah, I don't know why I said lots of bass. I kind of I kind of envisioned that if I was a truck driver, that cab that they have in the back, yep. the, that would just be like the back box <laughs> for my sub. My, it'd be like Marty McFly with the big driver in there or whatever. Okay. I guess if you're owner-operator, yeah. Uh, yeah. If you're owner-operator, you probably want to sleep back there. JR says he's a truck driver, so he's got about 12 hours a day to listen to podcasts. Uh-oh. Hey, you know what you should listen to? Uh, it's not going to take you 12 hours, but uh, the podcast somebody turned me on to, uh, Everything is Alive. Have you heard of this? Oh, I've heard of it. I haven't listened to it, but it's, I've heard of it, yeah. It's clever. It's interesting. And basically what they do is they interview inanimate objects. Yes, yeah. And people, so they have like, comedians or actors or whatever who kind of improv being an uh, inanimate object. The first one's like, the guy's a can of soda. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a light post. There's a bar of soap. So there's not there's only like five or six episodes and they're not they're like twenty minutes long. So Jr. This is not going <laughs> to fill up your day, but it's worth listening to. Um, and then 
you know, my wife listens to Dave Ramsey because she does all the money. Those are the only two I know of. He stumbled across ours and really likes our podcast. So yay. And he's quickly burned through the episodes, I guess so, that were in our <laughs> iTunes feeds. And we've already sold him on getting a P- uh, SVS PP1000 soon. That should fill up the base in your cab. His theater room is seven. T- uh, I'm sorry, 11 feet, 7 inches wide, 19 and a half feet long, and 9 feet high. So similar to my dimensions, except not quite. Uh, mine's shorter than that. He negotiated with his wife and got the couch position four feet off the back wall. So that's uh, 15 feet from the front, right? Uh, so it's still about a 15 foot. Oh, just keep reading, Tom. So it's still <laughs> about a 15 foot uh, viewing distance. And the front speakers seem to be pushed close to the front wall as well. Okay. So we're getting, seeing some pictures here. If you're watching us on YouTube, you want to see the full thing. Uh, and there's a blurry dog. I guess he's blurred out. To protect- <laughs> oh, yes. To protect his, to protect his, uh, his identity. That was always and, my it, favorite Mitch Hedberg joke. Is like maybe it just is blurry. <laughs> so the the front speakers are angled towards the center and right in the front left and right corners. Yes. Okay. Uh, based on what I'm seeing here, and the the rear speakers are in the front in the back left and right corners and angled slightly in, mm-hmm. just towed in, mm-hmm. just like the front speakers are, and then there's couch. Yeah. It's so he's been couch. He's been using a 6.1 Onkyo home theater in a box with no HDMI inputs, so it's Christmas. He decided it's time to upgrade. He started with the idea of just upgrading to a modern home theater in a box just to get HDMI switching. He's ready to go. Uh, he's about ready to get a Sony package, but then he did some reading and discovered Atmos. Now he's fallen down that rabbit hole, and all of this was before <laughs> listening to us. Well, thank goodness you found us. Mm. And while he was down the rabbit hole, he immediately went over his budget by about double when he found some deals on the Onkyo TXR... RZ730 receiver with some clips. R2650. God, these numbers. 2650. Mark, Mark two in wall and in ceiling speakers and two pairs of in wall speakers. The two pairs of in wall speakers are awaiting installation as a surround and surround back speakers, and the two pairs of in ceiling speakers are awaiting installation as the Atmos overheads. By the way, you did not need clip speakers in this room. Well, but let's these particular clip speakers, they're not horn loaded. These oh, okay. are their regular, it's the Silk Dome tweeter, the polypropylene woofer. So these are quite standard in-wall and in-ceiling speakers. They don't really have any of the Klipsch hallmarks. It's not titanium, it's not horn-loaded, so they're pretty this normal. This should make this room feel a little bit um, less cluttered with those uh, speakers in the back. Mm, yeah. Uh, so, uh, okay, the RZ730 can power nine speakers on its own, but it can process 11 speakers. So he was planning on using his own, his old Onkyo home theater in the box receiver. It's a two-channel amp, and that should be fine, right? Well, yeah, as long as you set the, the volume level to zero, whatever references on that mm-hmm. thing, and then uh, don't ever touch it again. That's <laughs> right. The knob, yeah, it's just take a, the knob off. Just a stereo input and to drive, like, one pair of overhead speakers or something, totally fine. Put it, in, put it into pure direct mode and turn off any bass management or any of that stuff. Yep. And uh, you should be fine. And now it's an amp. Yeah. So he liked, uh, he'd like our recommendations for his front three speakers. They These do not have to be in walls, but as mentioned, they will need to be positioned close to the front wall. That has had him considering models with front ports. And of course, he was also considering clips since his in wall speakers and insulating speakers are all clips. But again, so, they're not the right. regular clips. So I totally wouldn't have to match them to other clips yeah. in this case. So this is all for movies, and since he's already come this far, he wants to make sure he, this end result is going to be killer. So which front, le- left, center, right speaker should he get? He's thinking his budget around 600 to 750 for all three speakers. Uh, can I say RBH again? Because I feel like oh. RBH is the one I would go for with their impression series. If, I mean, are they, they still they call are, them impression? Yeah, it's still the impression series. Uh, those are rear ported, all of them, though. Yeah. So do we care? Do we care? I don't really care. I don't really care. Because I, I have a similar thing, which is, I mean, it's it's always our go-tos, right? But I'm like, if you don't care about re-reporting, and if you got... Okay, so I'm going to say Ascend, something in their SE series, the CMT340 Center, the CBM or CMB. Uh, gosh, I don't remember. 170 SEs, anyway, the bookshelf speakers, as your front left, right. And Dave himself will tell you that three inches of clearance to the port on the back is sufficient. And looking, say, looking at yeah, this yeah. room, I'm like, you, there must be a way to get three inches from the back of the speaker. Right. Right. So I am, yeah, I am of the same opinion. I mean, if you're really super worried about it, I mean, you could put, you know, an inch 
a two inches, and then one of those inches, you could put a little bit of a panel back there. Oh, <laughs> just know, some right, absorption. Right, little bit just of some absorption. absorption right behind, yep. right behind the, the port. I mean, you could literally just get some insulation. <laughs> and just stick well, I mean, it to the wall. You know? I, I, why not make it a panel at this point? He's, he's basically got them in the front corners, so yeah, why not yeah. just make it a panel, a two-inch panel, yeah. and then you can basically put the board as, almost as close as you please. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm not going to limit myself to only front-ported or only sealed or something. I mean, I, I did, I must say, one of my immediate thoughts was NHT, but I'd want to go above their Super Series, at which point it goes past this budget really quickly. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement, RBH or Ascend, you can't go wrong with either of those. You, you just can't. They're so, again, you don't like the way it sounds, it's not your speakers that are to blame with either right. of those choices. So really hard for me to say, uh, yeah, why not? And that's two choices. Bring them both in, listen to them both, decide which one you like better. It's not going to cost you a pile of money or anything. So ideally, the tweeters of your front three speakers would be at seated ear level, correct? But for the, for the center speaker, the TV prevents that. So which is better, above the TV or below the TV? I think below, generally speaking, is better. But it's really all about what's between you and the TV. Mm -hmm. So you want to angle your speaker so that it, the tweeter is shooting at the ear level of the couch. Yeah, yeah um, I mean, it should be like I aiming right at your face. <laughs> so if, if your TV is real high, well, then lower is better. If your TV is real low, then higher could be mm -hmm. fine. But in the end, it's not really going to matter. Your brain is going to automatically shift that dialogue down to where they see the mouse. Yeah. I mean, I will also say for, for he, this isn't his case, but some people have multiple rows of seats, in which case above the screen often works better for that because you just have a clearer line of sight to right. all your rows of seats if the center right. is above the... Uh, although... You know, often that's a projection setup. At which point, that's yeah. too high because you know your projection screen. If you put the center above that, it's probably going to be on your ceiling practically. So right. that's where ideally it would be behind an acoustically transparent screen. But none of this applies to JR in your setup. One row of seats. It's probably going to be more convenient to just put it directly below your television, and you might need to tilt it up a little bit so that's aiming right at your face. So once the center has been placed, should the tweeters of the front, left, and right speakers match the height of the center, or should they go still go at seated ear level, even though the center won't match that height? The second one, you're going to put those right where they should be. The, the your, center your is... Cent your center is the compromise. Exactly, yeah. Your center is being... Ideally, it would be at seated ear height, and it would be behind an acoustically transparent screen. And it that's... would be the exact same speaker as the other two. That's so, right, yeah. yeah. And still vertical yeah. and everything. So you'd have three identical vertical speakers uh, behind an acoustically transparent screen at seated ear height. So the horizontal lowered center speaker that's tilted up at you, that is the one that's being compromised a little. There's no reason to compromise the front left, right. There tweeters stay at your seated, seated ear height. So what about the placement height of the surround speaker? So the placement height of surround speakers, depending on who you're listening, the Dolby's revisionist history or us. <laughs> so Dolby's revisionist history says that they have always recommended that you put it directly at ear level, eh. basically directly to your sides. No, they didn't. They've never they said that. They definitely did not. They definitely did. But they now say that. And I, I still think it's a bad idea. I still so think what it's a bad you, idea. Well. You want it a, a, a little bit behind the couch, just a little just bit. Just a little bit, yeah. Yeah, a little bit behind your head, not behind the couch. A little bit behind your head. Your, his couch is really thick, okay? And about a foot or foot and a half up. Yep. Just so that you have enough so that everybody can kind of see the speaker yeah. as they're seated. And That's he it. did, uh, the email, the wording, I wasn't 100% sure, but it sounded like he was wondering if the surrounds and the surround backs need to be at the same height like whatever that height is if no. all four of those must be all at exactly the same height nope nope they don't no. all have to be exactly at the same height and you don't need surround backs <laughs> let's yeah. let's just get he's off got that him one though right so <laughs> yeah well, well he's got four he's got four feet behind him he negotiated for that that's sufficient that's the bare minimum i would have for having surround backs so the manual for the Klipsch in-wall speakers he bought recommends having leaving three feet between the uh, sidewall and the speaker. And of course, Dolby's Atmos uh, placement guidelines now have the surround and surround backs right at ear height while showing the surround backs being the same distance apart as the front left and right speakers. Okay, that last one is true. <laughs> JR thinks our advice of having a clear line of sight to every seat makes more sense. But what is the best compromise here? His front left and right speakers are basically in his front corners since his room isn't very wide. So should his surround back speakers be higher and closer together than when Dolby shows in their placement guide? I in your situation I would say yes and that's because Agreed. you've spewed your your front speakers out very wide mm -hmm. 
because of I mean, they're not actually room. very wide. They're just wide considering the width of the room, but the room is right. narrow. So, yeah. Yeah. So your surround back speakers should be closer together, I think, I agree. and higher than your probably even your surrounds because it looks like your couch has got a, a tall back. Mm -hmm. So you're going to want them up a little bit higher as well. And facing straight forward. Oh, yeah. Because... Yeah. yeah, again, I mean, maybe an, a foot elevated, you know, so uh, tweeter, start with tweeter at ear height and maybe go about a foot above that. That should be sufficient. That'll clear the back of your couch. The, the tweeters won't be firing directly into the back of your head. Um, but yeah, I would, I would have them a little away from the side walls as, as surround backs in particular, because these aren't just replacing the surrounds that he currently has in his rear corners. He's going to have right. surrounds on the side walls and surround backs. And you want those to sound like they are behind you, not right. to your sides, because that's what the side surrounds are for. I mean, in THX recommendations have the yes. surround back speakers almost right next to each other. Yeah, like as a almost foot a, apart, only a foot yeah. apart. So I think you can, you can, you have a lot more room to play with the mm -hmm. surround backs than you do the surrounds. So he could put the, the in-ceiling speakers three feet in front and three feet behind him and call them top fronts and top rears, but then the top rears will only be about a foot from the back wall. What would we recommend? I In this situation, now, with the surrounds, surround backs, mm -hmm. all being kind of in close proximity, mm -hmm. I don't know that I would go with top rears. I'd probably do top middles. I would do top middles and front heights. Uh, front I mean, you, heights. Have to, you have to call them front heights, but you could basically put them about six feet in front of your seat. Yeah. And then the top middles would be basically directly above your seat, which you'll notice that a little bit more. It makes that Atmos yeah. effect that much Again, clearer. you're going to cheat those in a little bit from the side. That, which is his very last question, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, how far from the side wall should the Atmos uh, ceiling speakers be? Again, Dolby says to have them the same width apart as the front left and right. But if he did that, they'd be very close to the side walls where to put them. I would put them in a like at least a foot, foot and a half in. I mean, I his, his seats do basically go wall to wall, right? Yeah. So normally we'd have them like just to the outside of your seats, but that really isn't an option in this setup. Right. So yeah, I mean... Like right over the top of the person who's sitting in in, in each corner, <laughs> I guess this is kind of how I would kinda, do it. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, you want that sound to be like, oh yeah, that's coming from above me. So yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I'd cheat them in what, a foot and a half from the sidewall? That seems like a good compromise. Yeah. Okay. There you go. And uh, yeah, right. directly above and about six feet in front of you on the ceiling. Call call it front heights. It'll work totally fine. That's it for this week's AV it rant is. podcast. And we've we've cleared out our questions. That's good. We we are Again. caught up. So let's thank our uh, listeners of the week, Robert, for going to www.avrant.com and leaving us a cup of coffee link, uh, clicking on the cup of coffee link and leaving us a PayPal donation. Mm -hmm. And to our sixty, I'm sorry, seventy six patrons over at Patreon.com. Yeah, patreon.com slash podcast. if you'd like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation. Thanks to our 76 patrons, and thank you to Robert, which I think is Bob, uh, for giving us a donation via PayPal on our website. Appreciate it. We want to thank Jason and Greg for uh, offering to provide my brother with a PS3. I will take all of your PS3s. Yes. Boshko, we want to thank him for talking us up to SVS. Yeah, Jason, Greg, Boshko, thanks so much for supporting the podcast. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Mandry. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.